Chapter 14 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Owl Livia. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867 to 1923. Chapter 14, Section 3. The Other Viewpoint the will to power. We have, so far, considered the problem of the psychology of the unconscious processes, mainly from the point of view of Freud. We have thereby doubtless gained an inkling of a real truth, which, perhaps our pride, our consciousness of civilization, tries to deny, although something else in us affirms it. This situation is extremely irritating to some people, arousing resistances, and at the same time they are terror-stricken by it a fact which they are most unwilling to acknowledge. There is something terrible in admitting this conflict, for it is an acknowledgment of being swayed by instinct. Has it ever been understood what it means to confess to the sway of instinct? Nietzsche desired to be so swayed and advocated it most seriously. He even sacrificed himself throughout his whole life with rare passion to the idea of the superman, that is, to the idea of the man who, obeying his instincts, transcends even his very self. And what was the course of his life? It turned out, as Nietzsche himself prophesied in the passage in Zarathustra, relating to the fatal fall of the rope dancer, of the man who did not want to be surpassed. Zarathustra says to the dying rope dancer, Thy soul will be dead even sooner than thy body. And later, the dwarf says to Zarathustra, O Zarathustra, thou stone of wisdom, thou threwest thyself high, but every thrown stone must fall, condemned of thyself and to thine own stoning. O Zarathustra, far indeed threwest thou the stone, but upon thyself will it recoil. When he cried his Ecce Homo over himself, it was again too late, and the crucifixion of the soul began even before the body was dead. He who thus taught yea saying to the instincts of life must have his own career looked at critically in order to discover the effects of this teaching upon the teacher. But if we consider his life from this point of view, we must say that Nietzsche lived beyond instinct, in the lofty atmosphere of heroic sublimity. This height could only be maintained by means of most careful diet, choice, climate, and, above all, by many opiates. Finally, the tension of this living shattered his brain. He spoke of yea saying, but lived the nay. His horror of people, especially of the animal man who lives by instinct, was too great. He could not swallow the toad of which he so often dreamt, and which he feared he must yet gulp down. The Zarathustran lion roared all the higher men who craved for life back into the cavernous depths of the unconscious. That is why his life does not convince us of the truth of his teaching. The higher man should be able to sleep without chloral, and be competent to live in Nomburg or Basel despite the fogs and shadows. He wants woman and offspring, he needs to feel he has some value and position in the herd. He longs for innumerable commonplaces, and not least for what is humdrum. It is this instinct that Nietzsche did not recognize. It is, in other words, the natural animal instinct for life. But how did he live if it was not from natural impulse? Should Nietzsche really be accused of a practical denial of his natural instincts? He would hardly agree to that. Indeed, he might even prove, and without difficulty, that he really was following his instincts in the highest sense. But we may well ask, how is it possible that human instincts could have led him so far from humanity, into absolute isolation, into an aloofness from the herd which he supported with loathing and disgust? One would have thought that instinct would have united, would have coupled and begot, that it would tend towards pleasure and good cheer, towards gratification of all sensual desires. But we have quite overlooked the fact that this is only one of the possible directions of instinct. There exists not only the instinct for the preservation of the species, the sexual instinct, but also the instinct for the preservation of the self. Nietzsche obviously speaks of this latter instinct, that is, of the will to power. Whatever other kinds of instinct may exist are for him only a consequence of the will to power. Viewed from the standpoint of Freud's sexual psychology, this is a gross error, a misconception of biology, a bad choice made by a decadent, neurotic human being. For it would be easy for any adherent of sexual psychology to prove that all that was too lofty, too heroic, 
In Nietzsche's conception of the world and of life was nothing but a consequence of the repression and misconception of instinct, that is, of the instinct that this psychology considers fundamental. This brings us to the question of perception, or rather, it were better to say, of the various lenses through which the world may be perceived. For it would hardly be permissible to pronounce a judgment on a life like Nietzsche's. It was lived with rare consistency, from the beginning to the fateful end, in accordance with his underlying natural fundamental instinct for power. It would hardly do to pronounce it to be merely figurative, otherwise we should make the same unjust condemnation that Nietzsche pronounced upon his polar opposite, Richard Wagner, of whom he said, Everything in him is false. What is genuine is hidden or disguised. He's an actor, in every bad and good meaning of the word. Why this judgment? Wagner is a precise representative of that other fundamental instinct, which Nietzsche overlooked and upon which Freud's psychology is based. If we inquire whether the other main instinct, that of power, was unconsidered by Freud, we shall find that he has included it under the name of ego instinct. But these ego instincts drag out an obscure existence, according to his psychology, alongside the broad, all too broad, development of the sexual theme. In reality, however, human nature wages a cruel and hardly to be ended warfare between the ego principle and that of formless instinct. The ego is all barriers. Instinct, on the other hand, is without any limits. Both principles are equally powerful. In a certain sense, men may account themselves fortunate in being conscious of only one instinct. Therefore, he who is wise avoids getting to know the other. But if, after all, he does get to know the other instinct, he is indeed a lost man, for then he enters upon the Faustian conflict. Goethe has shown us in the first part of Faust what the acceptance of instinct involves, and, in the second part, what the acceptance of the ego and of his gruesome unconscious world would signify. Everything that is insignificant, petty, and cowardly in us shrinks from it and would avoid it, and there is one admirable means of doing so, namely by discovering that the other thing in us is another fellow, a live man who actually thinks, feels, does, and desires all the things that are despicable and odious. In this way, the bogey is seized and the battle against him is begun to our satisfaction. Hence arise also those chronic idiosyncrasies of which the history of morals has preserved a few examples for us. The instance of Nietzsche contra Wagner already cited is particularly transparent, but ordinary human life is crammed full of such cases. It is by these ingenious devices that man saves himself from the Faustian catastrophe for which he evidently lacks both courage and strength. But a sincere man knows that even his bitterest opponent, or any number of them, does not by any means equal his one worst adversary, that is, his other self who bides within his breast. Nietzsche unconsciously had Wagner in himself. That is why he envied him his Parsifal. But even worse, he was a Saul and also had Paul within. That is why Nietzsche became a stigmatized outcast of the spirit. He had, like Saul, the experience of Christification when the other self inspired him with his Ecce Homo. What man in him broke down before the cross, Wagner or Nietzsche? It was ordained by destiny that one of Freud's earliest pupils, Adler, should formulate a view of neurosis as founded exclusively upon the principle of power. It is interesting and even fascinating to observe how totally different the same things appear when viewed in another light. In order to emphasize the main contrast, I would like at once to draw attention to the fact that, according to Freud, Everything is a strictly causal consequence of previously occurring facts. Adler, on the contrary, sees everything as a finally conditioned arrangement. To take a simple example, a young woman begins to have attacks of terror. She wakes at night from some nightmare with a piercing cry. Calming herself with difficulty, she clings to her husband, imploring him not to leave her, making him repeat again and again that he loves her and so forth. Gradually, a nervous asthma develops attacks of which also come on during the day. In such a case, the Freudian system begins at once to burrow in the inner causality of the illness. What did the initial anxiety dreams contain? She recalls wild bulls, lions, tigers, bad men. What does the patient associate with them? She told the story of something that had happened to her when she was still single. It ran as follows. She was staying in a summer resort in the mountains. A great deal of tennis was played, the usual acquaintances being made. There was a young Italian who played particularly well and who also knew how to handle the guitar in the evenings. A harmless flirtation developed, leading once to a moonlight walk. 
On this occasion, the Italian temperament unexpectedly broke through, running away with the young man, to the great terror of the unsuspecting girl. He looked at her with such a look that she could never forget it. This look follows her even in her dreams. The wild animals that persecuted her had it. As a matter of fact, does this look originally come from the Italian? Another reminiscence enlightens us. The patient had lost her father through an accident when she was about 14 years old. The father was a man of the world and traveled a great deal. Not long before his death, he took her to Paris, where, among other things, they visited the Follies Berger. Something happened there that, at the time, made a deep impression upon her. As they were leaving the theater, a rouged female suddenly pressed up close to her father in an impertinent way. She looked at her father in fear as to what he would do, and then she saw that look, that animal glare in his eyes, an inexplicable something clung to her day and night. From this moment, her attitude to her father was quite changed. At one instant, she was irritable and full of venomous moods. At another, she loved him extravagantly. Then causeless fits of crying suddenly began. And, for a time, whenever her father was at home, she was tormented by terrible choking at table, with apparent attacks of suffocation, which were usually followed by voicelessness, lasting from one to two days. When the news of her father's sudden death arrived, she was overcome by uncontrolled grief, ending in hysterical laughter. But she soon calmed down, her condition improving quickly, and the neurotic symptoms disappearing almost completely. It seemed as if a veil of forgetfulness had descended over the past. Only the experience with the Italian roused something in her of which she was afraid. She'd broken off completely with the young man. A few years later, she married. The present neurosis only began after the birth of her second child, that is, at the moment when she discovered that her husband took a certain tender interest in another woman. This history raises a number of questions. For instance, what do we know about the mother? It should be said of her that she was very nervous and had tried many kinds of santoria and systems of cure. She also had symptoms of fear and nervous asthma. The relations between her and her husband had been very strained as far back as the patient could remember. The mother did not understand the father. The daughter always felt that she understood him better. She was, moreover, her father's declared favorite, being inwardly correspondingly cool towards her mother. These facts are indications for a survey of the meaning of the illness. Behind the present symptoms, fantasies are operative, connected in the first place with the young Italian, but further clearly referring to the father, whose unhappy marriage furnished the little daughter with an early opportunity of acquiring a position that really should have been filled by her mother. Behind this conquest there lies, of course, a fantasy of being the woman who was really suited to her father. The first attack of neurosis broke out at the moment when this fantasy received a violent shock, presumably similar to that the mother had once experienced, a fact that was, however, unknown to the child. The symptoms are easily comprehensible as the expression of disappointed and rejected love. The choking is based upon a sensation of tightening in the throat that is a well-known accompanying phenomenon of violent effects which we cannot quite swallow. The metaphors of language often refer to similar physiological occurrences. When the father died, it seemed that her consciousness sorrowed deeply, but her unconscious laughed after the manner of Till Eulenspiegel, who was sad when he went downhill, but was jolly when climbing laboriously, happy in anticipation of what was coming. When the father was at home, the girl was low-spirited and ill, but whenever he was away, she felt much better. Herein, she resembles numerous husbands and wives who, as yet, are mutually hiding from each other the secret that they are not, under all circumstances, indispensable to one another. That the unconscious had some right to laugh was shown by the subsequent period of good health. She succeeded in letting all that had passed retire behind the trap door. The experience with the Italian, however, threatened to bring the netherworld up again. But she quickly pulled the handle and shut the door. She remained quite well until the dragon of neurosis came creeping in, just when she imagined herself to be already safely out of her troubles in the, so to say, perfected state of wife and mother. Sexual psychology finds the cause of the neuroses in the fact that the patient is not, at bottom, free from the father. This forces her to resuscitate her former experience at the moment when she discovered in the Italian the very same disturbing something that had formerly made such a deep impression upon her when perceived in her father. These recollections were naturally revived by the analogous experience with another man and formed the starting point of the neuroses. It might, therefore, be said that the content and cause of the neuroses lay in the conflict between the fantastic infantile erotic relation to the father on one hand 
and her love for the husband on the other. But if we now consider the course of the same illness from the standpoint of the other instinct, that is, of the will to power, a different complexion is put upon the matter. Her parents' unhappy marriage afforded an excellent opportunity for the exhibition of childish instinct for power. The instinct for power desires that, under all circumstances, the ego should be on top, whether by straight or crooked means. At all costs, the integrity of the personality must be preserved. Every attempt, even what appears to be an attempt of the surroundings, to bring about the slightest subjection of the individual, is retorted to by the masculine protest, as Adler expresses it. The mother's disappointment and her taking refuge in a neurosis brought about the opportunity for the development of power and the attainment of a dominating position. Love and excellence of conduct are, as everybody knows, extremely well-adapted weapons for the purposes of the instinct for power. Virtue is not seldom made the means of forcing recognition from others. Already as a child, she knew how to obtain a privileged position with her father by means of specially pleasing and amiable behavior, even, occasionally, to supplant her mother. This was not out of love for her father, although love was a good means of obtaining the coveted superiority. The hysterical laughter at the death of her father is a striking proof of this fact. One is inclined to consider such an explanation as a deplorable depreciation of love, if not actually a malicious insinuation. But let us pause for a moment, reflect, and look at the world as it really is. Have we never seen those innumerable people who love and believe in their love only until its purpose is achieved, and who then turn away as if they had never loved? After all, does not nature herself do the same? In fact, is a purposeless love possible? If so, it belongs to the highest human virtues, which, confessedly, are extremely rare. Perhaps there is a general disposition to reflect as little as possible about the nature and purpose of love. Discoveries might be made which would show the value of one's own love to be less considerable than we had supposed. However, it were dangerous to life to subtract anything from the value of fundamental instincts, perhaps especially so today, when we seem to have only a minimum of values left. So the patient had an attack of hysterical laughter at the death of her father. She had finally arrived at the top. It was hysterical laughter, therefore a psychogenic symptom, that is, something proceeding from the unconscious motives and not from those of the conscious ego. That is a difference that should not be underrated, for it enables us to recognize whence and how human virtues arise. Their contraries led to hell, that is, in modern terms, to the unconscious, where the counterparts of our conscious virtue had long been gathering. That's why our very virtue makes us desire to know nothing of the unconscious. Indeed, it is even the summit of virtuous wisdom to maintain that there is no unconscious at all. But unfortunately, we are all in a like predicament with Brother Medardus in E.T.A. Hoffman's The Elixir of the Devil. Somewhere or other there exists a sinister, terrible brother, our own incarnate counterpart, bound to us by flesh and blood, who comprehends everything, maliciously hoarding whatever we most desire and should disappear beneath the table. The first outbreak of neurosis occurred in our patient at the moment when she became aware of the fact that there was something in her father which she did not control, and then it dawned upon her of what use her mother's neurosis was. When one meets with an obstacle that cannot be overcome by sensible and charming means, there yet exists an arrangement hitherto unknown to her which her mother had been beforehand in discovering, and that is neuroses. That is the reason why she now imitates her mother. But the astonished reader asks, what is supposed to be the use of neurosis? What does it affect? Whoever has had a pronounced case of neurosis in his immediate environment knows all that can be affected by a neurosis. In fact, there is altogether no better means of tyrannizing over a whole household than by a striking neurosis. Heart attacks, choking fits, convulsions of all kinds achieve enormous effects that can hardly be surpassed. Picture the fountains of pity let loose, the sublime anxiety of the dear, kind parents, the hurried running to and fro of the servants, the incessant sounding of the call to the telephone, the hasty arrival of the physicians, the delicacy of the diagnosis, the detailed examinations, the lengthy courses of treatment, the considerable expense. And there, in the midst of all the uproar, lies the innocent sufferer, to whom the household is even overflowingly grateful when he has recovered from the spasms. The girl discovered this incomparable arrangement, to use Adler's term, applying it on occasion when the father was there with success. It became unnecessary when the father died, 
for now she was finally uppermost. The Italian was soon dismissed because he laid too much stress upon her femininity by an inopportune reminder of his manliness. When the way opened to the possibility of a suitable marriage, she loved, adapting herself without any complaint to the deplorable role of the queen bee. As long as she held the position of admired superiority, everything went splendidly. But when her husband evinced a small outside interest, she was obliged again to have recourse to the extremely efficacious arrangement, that is, to the indirect application of power, because she had once again come upon that thing, this time in her husband, that had already previously withdrawn her father from her influence. That is how the matter appears from the standpoint of the psychology of power. I fear that the reader will feel, as did the Cadi, before whom the counsel of one party spoke first. When he had ended, the Cadi said, Thou hast spoken well. I perceive that thou art right. Then spoke the counsel for the other party, and when he had ended, the Cadi scratched himself behind his ear and said, Thou hast spoken well. I perceive that thou art also right. There is no doubt that the instinct for power plays a most extraordinary part. It is true that the complexes of neurotic symptoms are also exquisite arrangements that inexorably realize their aims with incredible obstinacy and unequaled cunning. The neuroses is final, that is, it is directed towards an aim. Adler merits considerable distinction for having demonstrated this. Which of the two points of view is right? That is a question that might well cause much brain racking, for the two explanations cannot be simply combined, being absolutely contradictory. In one case, it is love and its course that is the principal and decisive fact. In the other case, it is the power of the ego. In the first case, the ego is merely a kind of appendage to the passion for love. And in the second, love is, upon occasion, merely a means to the end, that of gaining the upper hand. Whoever has the power of the ego most at heart rebels against the former conception, while he who cares most about love will never be able to be reconciled to the latter. End of chapter 14, section 3. Recording by Olivia. Chapter 14 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Courtney Miller. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long. 1867 to 1923. Chapter 14, Section 4. The Two Types of Psychology. It is at this point that our most recent researches may suitably be introduced. We have found, in the first place, that there are two types of human psychology. In the one type, the fundamental function is feeling, and in the other it is thought. The one feels his way into the object, the other thinks about it. The one adapts himself to his surroundings by feeling, thinking coming later whilst the other adapts himself by means of thought, preceded by understanding. The one who feels his way transfers himself to some extent to the object, whilst the other withdraws himself from the object to some extent, or pauses before it and reflects about it. The first we called the extroverted type, because in the main he goes outside himself to the object. The latter is called the introverted type, because in a major degree he turns away from the object, withdrawing into himself and thinking about it. These remarks only give the broadest outline of the two types. But even this quite inadequate sketch enables us to recognize that the two theories are the outcome of the contrast between the two types. The sexual theory is promulgated from the standpoint of feeling, the power theory from that of thought, for the extrovert always places the accent upon the feelings that are connected with the object, whereas the introvert always puts the accent upon the ego and is as much detached by thought from the object as possible. The irreconcilable contradictions of the two theories are now to be understood, because both theories are the product of a one-sided psychology. We find an instance of the contrast of types in Nietzsche and Wagner. The dissension between the two is due to the contrast in their ideas of psychological values. What is most prized by the one is affectation for the other, and is deemed false to the very core. Each depreciates the other. If we apply the sexual theory to an extrovert, it tallies with the facts of the case but if we apply it to an introvert, we simply maltreat and do violence to his psychology. The same applies to the contrary case. The relative rightness of the two hostile theories is explained by the fact that each one draws its material from cases that prove the correctness of the theory. There is a remnant of persons whom neither theory fits. Has not every rule its exceptions? 
Criticism of both theories is indispensable. Recognition of facts showed the necessity of overcoming their contrast, and of evolving a theory that should do justice not only to one or the other type, but equally to both. Even the layman will, to some extent, have been struck by the fact that in spite of their correctness, both theories really have a very unpleasant character, and one not altogether pertinent, under all circumstances, to the strict views of science. The sexual theory is unesthetic, and unsatisfying intellectually. The power theory, on the other hand, is decidedly venomous. Both inevitably reduce high-flown ideals, heroic attitudes, pathos, and deep convictions in a painful manner to a reality which is hackneyed and trite. That is, if these theories are applied to such things, but they should certainly not be so applied. Both theories are really only therapeutic instruments out of the tool chest of the physician, whose sharp and merciless knife cuts out all that is pernicious and diseased. It was just such a misapplication of theory Nietzsche tried with his destructive criticism of ideals. He regarded ideals as rampant diseases of the soul of humanity, as indeed they really are. However, in the hands of a good physician who really knows the human soul, who, as Nietzsche says, has a finger for the slightest shade, who applies the treatment only to what is really diseased in the soul, in such hands both theories prove wholesome caustics. The application must be adapted to the individual case. It is a dangerous therapy in the hands of those who do not understand how to deal out the treatment. These applications of criticism do good when there is something that should and must be destroyed, dissolved, or brought low, but can easily damage what is being built up or growing in response to life's requirements. Both theories might, therefore, be allowed to pass without attack, insofar as they, like medicinal poisons, are entrusted to the safe hands of the physician. But fate has ordained that they should not remain solely in the care of those who are qualified to use them. First of all, they naturally became known to the medical public. Every practicing physician has an indefinitely high percentage of neurotics among his patients. He is therefore more or less obliged to look out for new and suitable systems of treatment. He ultimately lights upon the difficult method of psychoanalysis. He is at first not competent for this, for how should he have learnt about the secrets of the human soul? Certainly not through his academic studies. The smattering of psychiatry that he acquired for his examination barely suffices to enable him to recognize the symptoms of the commonest mental disturbances, and is far from giving him any sufficient insight into the human soul. He is, therefore, practically quite unprepared to apply the analytic method. An unusually far-reaching knowledge of the soul is indeed necessary in order to be able to apply this caustic treatment with advantage. One must be in a position to differentiate elements that are diseased and should be discarded, from those which are valuable and should be retained. This is plainly a matter of great difficulty. Anyone who wishes to get a vivid impression of the way in which a psychologizing physician may unwarrantably violate a patient through an ignoble pseudoscientific prejudice should read what Mobius has written about Nietzsche or he may study various psychiatric writings about the case of Christ, and will surely not hesitate to lament the lot of the patient whose fate it is to meet with such understanding. Psychoanalysis, greatly to the regret of the medical man who, however, had not accepted it, then passed over into the hands of the teaching profession. This is right, for it is really, when rightly understood and handled, an educational method, and one of the social sciences. I would, however, never personally recommend that Freud's purely sexual analysis should be exclusively applied as an educational method. It might do much harm because of its one-sidedness. In order to make psychoanalysis available for educational purposes, all the metamorphoses that have been the work of the last few years were needed. The method had to be expanded from a general psychological point of view. But the two theories of which I have spoken are not general theories. They are, as I have said, caustics to be applied, so to say, locally, for they are both destructive and reductive. They explain to the patient that his symptoms come from here or there, and are nothing but this or that. It would be very unjust to wish to maintain that this reductive theory is wrong in a given case, but when exalted into a general explanation of the nature of the soul, whether sick or healthy, a reductive theory becomes impossible. For the human soul, whether it be sick or healthy, cannot be merely reductively explained. Sexuality, it is true, is always and everywhere present. The instinct for power certainly does penetrate the heights and the depths of the soul, but the soul itself is not solely either the one or the other, or even both together. It is also that which it has made and will make out of them both. A person is only half understood when one knows how everything in him came about. Only a dead man can be explained in terms of the past. 
a living one must be otherwise explained. Life is not made up of yesterdays only, nor is it understood nor explained by reducing today to yesterday. Life has also a tomorrow, and today is only understood if we are able to add the indications of tomorrow to our knowledge of what was yesterday. This holds good for all expressions of psychological life, even for symptoms of disease. Symptoms of neurosis are not merely consequences of causes that once have been, whether they were infantile sexuality or infantile instinct for power. They are endeavors towards a new synthesis of life. It must immediately be added, however, they are endeavors that have miscarried. Nonetheless, they are attempts. They represent the germinal striving which has both meaning and value. They are embryos that fail to achieve life, owing to unpropitious conditions of an internal and external nature. The reader will now probably propound the question, what possible value and meaning can a neurosis have? Is it not a most useless and repulsive pest of humanity? Can being nervous do anybody good? Possibly, in a way similar to that of flies and other vermin, which were created by God in order that man might exercise the useful virtue of patience. Stupid as this thought is from the standpoint of natural science, it might be quite shrewd from that of psychology. That is, if we substitute nervous systems in the place of vermin. Even Nietzsche, who had an uncommon disdain for anything stupid and trite in thought, more than once acknowledged how much he owed to his illness. I have known more than one person who attributed all his usefulness, and the justification for his existence even, to a neurosis, that hindered all decisive stupidities of his life, compelling him to lead an existence which developed what was valuable in him. Material that would have been crushed had not the neurosis with its iron grip forced the man to keep to the place where he really belonged. There are people the meaning of whose life, whose real significance, lies in the unconscious. In consciousness lies only all that is vain and delusive. With others, the reverse is the case, and for them, the neurosis has another significance. An extended reduction is appropriate to the one, but emphatically unsuitable to the other. The reader will now, indeed, be inclined to agree to the possibility of certain cases of neurosis having such a significance, but will nevertheless be ready to deny an expediency that is so far-reaching and full of meaning to ordinary cases of this illness. What value, for instance, might there be in the aforementioned case of asthma and hysterical attacks of fear? I confess that the value here is not so obvious, especially if the case be looked at from the standpoint of a reductive theory that is, from that of a chronique scandaleuse, of the psychological development of an individual. We perceive that both the theories hitherto discussed have this one point in common, vis a -vis, they relentlessly disclose everything that is valueless in people. They are theories, or rather hypotheses, which explain wherein this cause of the sickness lies. They are accordingly concerned not with the values of a person, but with his lack of value that makes itself evident in a disturbing way. From this point of view, it is possible to be reconciled to both standpoints. A value is a possibility by means of which energy may attain development. But insofar as a negative value is also a possibility through which energy may attain development, as may, for instance, be clearly seen in the very considerable manifestations of energy shown in neurosis, it also stands for a value, albeit it brings about manifestations of energy which are useless and harmful. In itself, energy is neither useless nor harmful, neither full of value nor lacking in it. It is indifferent, everything depending upon the form into which it enters. The form gives the quality to the energy. On the other side, mere form without energy is also indifferent. Therefore, in order to bring about a positive value, on the one hand energy is necessary, and upon the other a valuable form. In a neurosis, psychic energy is undoubtedly present but in an inferior and not realizable form. Both the analytic methods that have been discussed above are of service only as solvents of this inferior form. They prove themselves good here as caustics. By these methods we gain energy that is certainly free, but which, being as yet unapplied, is indifferent. Hitherto the supposition prevailed that this newly acquired energy was at the patient's conscious disposal, that he might apply it in any way he liked, Insofar as it was thought that the energy was nothing but the sexual impulse, people spoke of a sublimated application of the same, under the presumption that the patient could, without further ado, transfer what was thought of as sexual energy into a sublimation, that is, into a non-sexual form of use. It might, for instance, be transferred to the cultivation of an art, or to some other good or useful activity. According to this concept, 
the patient had the possibility of deciding either arbitrarily or from inclination how his energy should be sublimated. This conception may be accorded a justification for its existence, insofar as it is at all possible for a human being to assign a definite direction to his life, in which its course should run. But we know that there is no human forethought nor philosophy which can enable us to give our lives a prescribed direction, except for quite a short distance. Destiny lies before us, perplexing us, and teeming with possibilities, and yet only one of these many possibilities is our own particular right way. Who should presume to designate the one possibility beforehand, even though he have the most complete knowledge of his own character that a man can have? Much can certainly be attained by means of willpower, but having regard to the fate of certain personalities with particularly strong wills, it is entirely misleading for us to want at all costs to change our own fate by power of will. Our will is a function that is directed by our powers of reflection. It depends, therefore, upon how our powers of reflection are constituted. In order to deserve its name, reflection must be rational, that is, according to reason. But has it ever been proved, or can it ever be proved, that life and destiny harmonize with our human reason, that is, that they are exclusively rational? On the contrary, we have ground for supposing that they are also irrational, that is to say, that in the last resort they too are based in regions beyond the human reason. The irrationality of the great process is shown by its so-called accidentalness, which perforce we ought to deny, since, obviously, we cannot think of a process not being casually and necessarily conditioned. But actually, accidentality exists everywhere, and does so indeed so obtrusively that we might as well pocket our casual philosophy. The rich store of life both is and is not determined by law. It is at the same time rational and irrational. Therefore the reason and the will founded upon it are only valid for a short distance. The further we extend this rationally chosen direction, the surer we may be that we are thereby excluding the irrational possibilities of life, which have, however, just as good a right to be lived. Aye, we even injure ourselves, since we cut off the wealth of accidental eventualities by a too rigid and conscious direction. It was certainly very expedient for man to be able to give his life a direction. It would, therefore, be quite right to maintain that the attainment of reasonableness was the greatest achievement of mankind. But that is not to say that under all circumstances this must or will always continue to be the case. The present fearful catastrophic world war has tremendously upset the most optimistic upholder of rationalism and culture. In 1913, Ostwald wrote as follows, The whole world agrees that the present state of armed peace is untenable, and is gradually becoming an impossible condition. It demands tremendous sacrifices from individual nations, far surpassing the outlay for cultural purposes, without any positive values being gained thereby. Therefore, if mankind could discover ways and means of putting an end to these preparations for a war that will never come, this conscripting of a considerable part of the nation at the best and most capable age for training for war purposes, if it could overcome all the innumerable other injuries caused by the present customs, such an enormous saving of energy would be effected, that an undreamt of development of the evolution of culture might be expected. For like a hand-to-hand -hand fight, war is the oldest and also the most unsuitable of all possible means of solving a conflict between wills, being indeed accompanied by the most deplorable waste of energy. The complete setting aside of potential, as well as of actual warfare is, therefore, absolutely one of the most important tasks of culture in our time, a real necessity from the point of view of energy. But the irrationality of destiny ordained otherwise than the rationality of the well-meaning thinker, since it not only determined to use the piled-up weapons and soldiers, but much more than that, it brought about a tremendous insane devastation and unparalleled slaughter. From this catastrophe, humanity may possibly draw the conclusion that only one side of fate can be mastered by rational intention. What can be said of mankind in general applies also to individuals, for mankind as a whole consists of nothing but individuals. And whatever the psychology of mankind is, that is also the psychology of the individual. We are experiencing in the world war a fearful balancing up with the rational intentionality of organized culture. What is called will in the individual is termed imperialism among nations, for the will is a demonstration of power over fate, that is, exclusion of what is accidental. The organization of culture is a rational and expedient sublimation of free and indifferent energies, brought about by design and intention. The same is the case in the individual, and just as the hope of a universal international organization of culture has experienced a cruel right-about through this war, 
so also must the individual, in the course of his life, often find that so-called disposable energies do not suffer themselves to be disposed of. I was once consulted by a businessman of about 45, whose case is a good illustration of the foregoing. He was a typical American self-made man, who had worked himself up from the bottom. He had been successful, and had founded a very extensive business. He had also gradually organized the business in such a way that he could now retire from its management. He had indeed resigned two years before I saw him. Until then, he had only lived for his business, concentrating all his energy upon it, with that incredible intensity and one-sidedness that is so peculiar to the successful American man of business. He had bought himself a splendid country seat, where he thought he would live, which he imagined to mean keeping horses, automobiles, playing golf and tennis, attending and giving parties, etc. But he had reckoned without his host. The energy that had become disposable did not enter into these tempting prospects, but betook itself capriciously to quite other ways. A couple of weeks after the commencement of his longed-for life of bliss, he began to brood over peculiar vague physical sensations. A few more weeks sufficed to plunge him into an unprecedented state of hypochondria. His nerves broke down completely. He, who was physically an uncommonly strong and exceptionally energetic man, became like a whining child, and that put an end to all his paradise. He fell from one apprehension to another, worrying himself almost to death. He then consulted a celebrated specialist, who immediately perceived quite rightly that there was nothing wrong with the man but lack of employment. The patient saw the sense of this, and betook himself to his former physician. But to his great disappointment, no interest for his business presented itself. Neither the application of patience nor determination availed to help. His energy would not by any means be forced back into the business. His condition naturally became worse than before. Energy that had hitherto been actively creative was now turned back into himself, with fearfully destructive force. His creative genius rose up, so to speak, in revolt against him, and instead of, as before, producing great organizations in the world, his demon now created equally clever systems of hypochondriac fallacies, by which the man was absolutely crushed. When I saw him, he was already a hopeless moral ruin. I tried to make clear to him that such a gigantic amount of energy might indeed be withdrawn from business, but the problem remained as to where it should go. The finest horses, the fastest automobiles, and the most amusing parties are in themselves no inducement for energy, although it is certainly quite rational to think that a man who has devoted his whole life to serious work has a natural right to enjoy himself. This would necessarily be the case if things happened humanly in destiny. First would come work, then well-earned leisure, but things happen irrationally and inconveniently enough. Energy requires a congenial channel, otherwise it is dammed up and becomes destructive. My arguments met with no response, as was indeed to be expected. Such an advanced case can only be taken care of till death. It cannot be cured. This case clearly illustrates the fact that it does not lie in our power to transfer a disposable energy to whatever rationally chosen object we may like. Exactly the same may be said of those apparently available energies that are made available by the fact that the psychoanalytical caustic has destroyed their unsuitable forms. These energies can be arbitrarily applied, as has already been said, at the very most only for a short time. They resist following the rationally presented possibilities for any length of time. Psychic energy is indeed a fastidious thing, that insists upon having its own conditions fulfilled. There may be ever so much energy existing, but we cannot make it useful, so long as we do not succeed in finding a congenial channel for it. The whole of my research work for the last years has been concentrated upon this question. The first stage of this work was to discover the extent to which the two theories discussed above were tenable. The second stage consisted in the recognition of the fact that these two theories corresponded to opposite psychological types, which I have designated the introversion and the extroversion types. William James was struck by the existence of these two types among thinkers. He differentiated them as the tough-minded and the tender-minded. Similarly, Ostwald discovered an analogous difference in the classical and romantic types among great scholars. I am not therefore alone in my ideas about the types, as is testified by mentioning only these two well-known names out of many others. Historical researches have proved to me that not a few of the great controversies in the history of thought were based upon the contrast between the types. The most significant case of this kind is the contrast between nominalism and realism, which, beginning with the difference between the Platonic and the Megarian schools, descended to scholastic philosophy, 
where Abelard won the immortal distinction of at least having ventured to an attempt to unite the two contradictory standpoints in conceptualism. This conflict has continued down to the present day, where it finds expression in the antagonism of spiritualism and materialism. Just as in the general history of thought, so too every individual has a share in this contrast of types. Close investigation proves that people of opposite types have an unconscious predilection for marrying each other, that they may mutually complement one another. Each type has one function that is specially well developed, the introvert using his thought as the function of adaptation, thinking beforehand about how he shall act, whilst the extrovert, on the contrary, feels his way into the object by acting. To some extent, he acts beforehand. Hence, by daily application, the one has developed his thought and the other his feeling. In extreme cases, the one limits himself to thinking and observing, and the other to feeling and acting. It is true that the introvert feels also, very deeply indeed, almost too deeply. That is why an English investigator has gone so far as to describe his as the emotional type. True, the emotion is there, but it all remains inside, and the more passionate and deeper his feeling is, the quieter is his outward demeanor. As the proverb puts it, still waters run deep. Similarly, the extrovert thinks also, but that likewise mostly inside. Whilst his feelings visibly go outside, that is why he is held to be full of feeling whilst the introvert is considered cold and dry. But as the feeling of the thinker goes inwards, it is not developed as a function adapted to external situations, but remains in a relatively undeveloped state. Similarly, the thinking of one who feels remains also relatively undeveloped. But if comparatively well-adapted individuals are under consideration, then the introvert will normally be found to have his feeling directed outwards, and the result may be extraordinarily deceptive. He shows feelings. He is amiable, sympathetic, even emotional. But a critical examination of the expressions of his feelings reveals that they are markedly conventional. They are not individualized. He shows to everyone, without any essential difference, the same friendliness and the same sympathy, whilst the extrovert's expressions of feeling are throughout delicately graded and individualized. With the introvert, the expression of feelings is really a gesture that is artificially adopted and conventional. Similarly, the extrovert may apparently think, and that even very clearly and scientifically, but upon closer investigation, his thoughts are found to be really foreign property, merely conventional forms which have been artificially acquired. They lack anything individual and original, and are just as lukewarm and colorless as the conventional feelings of the introvert. Under these conventional disguises, quite other things are slumbering in both, which occasionally, when awakened by some overpowering effect, suddenly break out to the astonishment and horror of the environment. Most civilized people incline more to one type than the other. Taken together, they would supplement each other exceedingly well. That is why they are so apt to marry one another, and so long as they are fully occupied with adapting themselves to the necessities of life, they suit one another splendidly. But if the man has earned a competence, or if a big legacy dropped from the sky, terminating the external urgencies of life, then they have time to occupy themselves with each other. Until now they stood back to back, defending themselves against want. But now they turn to each other expecting to understand one another, and they make the discovery that they have never understood one another. They speak different languages. Thus the conflict between the two types of psychology begins. This conflict is venomous, violent, and full of mutual depreciation, even if it be conducted very quietly in the utmost intimacy. This is so because the value of the one is the worthlessness of the other. The one, starting from the standpoint of his valuable thinking, takes for granted that the feelings of the other correspond to his own inferior feelings, this because he knows absolutely nothing of any other feelings. But the other, starting from the standpoint of his valuable feelings, assumes that his partner has the same inferior thought that he himself has. Evidently, there is plenty of work here for Gerdas, homunculus, who had to find out why husband and wife get on so badly. Now as many cases of neuroses have a basis in such differences, I, as a physician, found myself obliged to relieve the homunculus of some of his ungrateful task. I am glad to be able to say that many a sufferer has been helped in grave difficulties by the enlightenment I could give. The third stage of the path of increasing understanding consisted in formulating a theory of the psychology of types which would be of practical use for the development of man. Viewed from the newly gained standpoint, there resulted, first of all, a totally new theory of psychogenic disturbances. The foundation of the facts remains the same. The first hypothesis of every neurosis is the existence of an unconscious conflict. 
According to Freud's theory, this is an erotic conflict, or to speak more exactly, a battle of the moral consciousness against the unconscious infantile sexual world of fantasy and its transference to external objects. According to Adler's theory, it is a battle of the superiority of the ego against all oppressive influences, whether from inside or outside. But the new idea asserts that the neurotic conflict always takes place between the adapted function and the co-function that is undifferentiated and that lies to a great extent in the unconscious. Therefore, in the case of the introvert, between thought and unconscious feeling, but in that of the extrovert, between feeling and unconscious thought. Another theory of the etiological moment results from this. If a man who naturally adapts himself by thinking is faced by a demand that cannot be met by thinking alone, but which requires differentiated feeling, the traumatic or pathogenic conflict breaks out. On the contrary, the critical moment comes to the man who adapts by feeling when he is faced by a problem requiring differentiated thought. The aforementioned case of the businessman is a clear example of this. The man was an introvert, who all through his life had left every consideration of sentiment in the background, that is, in the unconscious. But when, for the first time in his life, he found himself in a situation in which nothing could be done except by means of differentiated feeling, he failed utterly. At the same time, a very instructive phenomenon occurred. His unconscious feelings manifested themselves as physical sensations of a vague nature. This fact harmonizes with the generally accepted experience in our psychology, to wit, that undeveloped feelings partake of the character of vague physical sensations, since undifferentiated feelings are as yet identical with subjective physical sensations. Differentiated feelings are of a more abstract objective nature. This phenomenon may well be the unconscious basis of the earliest statement of psychological types that is known to me, namely, the three types of the Valentinian school. They held the undifferentiated type to be the so-called hylic, material man. He was ranked below the differentiated types, that is, the psychic, soulful man, who corresponds to the extroversion type, and the pneumatic, spiritual man, who corresponds to the introversion type. For these Gnostics, the pneumaticos stood, of course, the highest. Christianity, with its psychic, spiritual nature, principle of love, has indeed contested this privilege of the Gnosis. But even this page may be turned in the course of time, since, if the signs of the age are not deceptive, we are now in the great final settlement of the Christian epoch. We know that, evolution not being uniformly continuous, when one form of creation has been outlived, the evolutionary tendency harks back to resume that form which, after having made a beginning, was left behind in an undeveloped state. After this brief digression to generalities, let us return to our case. If a similar disturbance were to take place in an extrovert, he would have what are called hysterical symptoms, that is, symptoms that are also of an apparently physical nature, which, as our theory indicates, would this time represent the patient's unconscious, undifferentiated thought. As a matter of fact, we find also a widespread region of fantasy as the basis of hysterical symptoms, of which many have been described in detail in the literature of the subject. There are fantasies of a pronounced sexual, that is physical, complexion. But in reality, they are undifferentiated thoughts, which in common with the undifferentiated feelings are to some extent physical, and therefore appear as what may be called physical symptoms. By taking up again here the thread that was dropped before, we can now clearly see why it is precisely in the neurosis that those values which are most lacking to the individual lie hidden. We might also now return to the case of the young woman, and apply to it the newly won insight. She is an extrovert with an hysterical neurosis. Let us suppose that this patient had been analyzed, that is, that the treatment having made it clear to her what kind of unconscious thoughts lay behind her symptoms, she had regained possession of the psychic energy which by becoming unconscious had constituted the strength of the symptoms. The following practical question now arises, what can be done with the so-called available energy? It would be rational, and in accordance with the psychological type of the invalid, to extrovert this energy again, that is to transfer it to an object, as for instance to philanthropic or some other useful activities. This way is possible only in exceptional cases. There are energetic natures who do not shrink from care and trouble in a useful cause. There are people who care immensely about just such occupations. Otherwise, it is not feasible. For it must not be forgotten that in the case under consideration, the libido, that is the technical expression for the psychic energy, has found its object already unconsciously in the young Italian, or an appropriate real human substitute. Under these circumstances, such a desirable sublimation, however natural, is out of the question. For the object of the energy usually affords a better channel than an ethical activity, however attractive. 
Unfortunately, there are many people who always speak of a person, not as he is, but as he would be if their desires for him were realized. But the physician is necessarily concerned with the actual personality, which will obdurately remain the same, until its real character has been recognized on all sides. An analysis must necessarily be based upon the recognition of naked reality, not upon any arbitrarily selected fantasies about a person, however desirable. The fact is that the so-called available energy unfortunately cannot be arbitrarily directed as desired. It follows its own channel, one which it had already found, even before we had quite released it from its bondage to the unadapted form. For we now make the discovery that the fantasies which were formerly occupied with the young Italian have been transferred to the physician himself. The physician has therefore himself become the object of the unconscious libido. If this is not the case, or if the patient will on no account acknowledge the fact of transference, or again if the physician either does not understand the phenomenon at all, or does so wrongly, then violent resistances make their appearance, which aim at completely breaking off relations with the doctor. At this point, patients leave and look for another doctor or for people who understand them or if they hopelessly relinquish the search, they go to pieces. But if the transference to the physician takes place and is accepted, a natural channel has thereby been found, which not only replaces the former, but also makes a discharge of the energetic process possible and provides a course that is relatively free from conflict. Therefore, if the libido is allowed its natural course, it will of its own accord find its way into the transference. Where this is not the case, it is always a question either of arbitrary rebellion against the laws of nature, or of some deficiency in the physician's work. Into the transference, every conceivable infantile fantasy is first of all projected. These must then be subjected to the caustic, that is, analytically dissolved. This was formerly called the dissolution of the transference. Thereby, the energy is freed from this unsuitable form also, and once again we are confronted by the problem of disposable energy. We shall find that an object affording the most favorable channel has been chosen by nature even before our search began. End of chapter 14. The Psychology of the Unconscious Processes. Part 4. The Two Types of Psychology. Chapter 14 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867 to 1923. Chapter 14, Section 5. The Personal and the Impersonal Unconscious. The fourth stage of our newly won insight is now reached. The analytical dissolution of the infantile transference fantasies was continued until it became sufficiently clear even to the patient, that he was making his physician into father, mother, uncle, guardian, teacher, friend, or any other kind of surrogate for parental authority conceivable. But, as experience is consistently proving, further fantasies make their appearance, representing the physician as savior or some other divine being. Obviously, this is in flagrant contradiction to the sane reasoning of consciousness, Moreover, it appears that these divine attributes considerably overstep the bounds of the Christian conception in which we grew up. They even assume the guise of heathen allurements and, for instance, not infrequently assume the form of animals. The transference is in itself nothing but a projection of unconscious contents onto the analyst. At first, it is the so-called superficial contents that are projected. During this stage, the physician is interesting as a possible lover somewhat after the manner of the young Italian in our case. Later on, he is a representation of the father, and is a symbol either of kindness or of severity, according to what the patient formerly imputed to his real father. Occasionally, the doctor even appears to the patient as a kind of mother, which, though sounding somewhat strange, really lies well within the bounds of possibility. All these projections of fantasy have an underlying basis of personal reminiscences. But presently, other forms of fantasy appear, bearing an extravagantly effusive and impossible character. The physician now appears to be endowed with uncanny qualities. He may be either a wizard or a demonical criminal, or his counterpart of virtue, a savior. Later on, he appears as an incomprehensible mixture of both sides. It should be clearly understood that the physician does not appear to the patient's consciousness in these forms, but that the fantasies come up to the surface representing the doctor in this guise. If as is not seldom the case, 
the patient cannot forthwith perceive that his view of the physician is a projection of his own unconscious, then he will probably behave rather foolishly. Difficulties often arise at this stage of analysis, making severe demands upon the goodwill and patience of both physician and patient. In a few exceptional cases, a patient cannot refrain from disseminating the stupidest tales about the physician. Such people cannot get it into their head that, as a matter of fact, their fantasies originate in themselves and have nothing or very little to do with the physician's actual character. The pertinacity of this error arises from the circumstance that there is no foundation of personal memory for this particular kind of projection. It is occasionally possible to prove that similar fantasies, for which neither parent gave reasonable occasion, had at some time in childhood been attached to the father or mother. In one of his shorter books, Freud has shown how Leonardo da Vinci was influenced in his later life by the fact that he had two mothers. The fact of the two mothers, or the double descent, has indeed a reality in Leonardo's case, but it plays a part with other artists as well. Benvenuto Cellini had this fantasy of a double descent. It is unquestionably a mythological theme. Many heroes of legend have two mothers. The fantasy is not founded upon the actual fact of the heroes having two mothers, but is a widespread primordial image belonging to the secrets of the universal history of the human mind. It does not belong to the sphere of personal reminiscences. In every individual, in addition to the personal memories, there are also, in Jacob Burkup's excellent phrase, the great primordial images, the inherited potentialities of human imagination. They have always been potentially latent in the structure of the brain. The fact of this inheritance also explains the otherwise incredible phenomenon that the matter and themes of certain legends are met with all over the world in identical forms. Further, it explains how it is that persons who are mentally deranged are able to produce precisely the same images and associations that are known to us from the study of old manuscripts. I gave some examples of this in my book, The Psychology of the Unconscious. I do not hereby assert the transmission of representations, but only of the possibility of such representations, which is a very different thing. It is, therefore, in this further stage of the transference that those fantasies are produced that have no basis in personal reminiscence. Here it is a matter of the manifestation of the deeper layers of the unconscious, where the primordial, universally human images are lying dormant. This discovery leads to the fourth stage of a new conception, that is, to the recognition of a differentiation in the unconscious itself. We are now obliged to differentiate a personal unconscious and an impersonal or superpersonal unconscious. We also term the latter the absolute or collective unconscious, because it is quite detached from what is personal, and because it is also absolutely universal, wherefore its contents may be found in every head, which of course is not the case with personal contents. The primordial images are quite the most ancient, universal, and deep thoughts of mankind. They are feeling just as much as thought, and might therefore be termed original thought feelings. We have therewith now found the object selected by the libido when it was freed from the personal, infantile form of transference, namely that it sinks down into the depths of the unconscious, reviving that which has been dormant there from immemorial ages. It has discovered the buried treasure out of which mankind from time to time has drawn, raising thence its gods and demons, and all those finest and most tremendous thoughts without which man would cease to be man. Let us take as an example one of the greatest thoughts to which the nineteenth century gave birth, the idea of the conservation of energy. Robert Mayer is the originator of this idea. He was a physician, not a physicist nor a natural philosopher, to either of whom the creation of such an idea would have been more germane. It is of great importance to realize that, in the real sense of the word, Robert Mayer's idea was not created, neither was it brought about by the fusion of the then-existent conceptions and scientific hypotheses. It grew in the originator and was conditioned by him. In 1841, Robert Mayer wrote to Gracinger as follows, I by no means concocted the theory at the writing desk. He goes on to report about certain physiological investigations that he made in 1840 and 41 as doctor on board ship, and continues, If one wishes to be enlightened about physiological matters, some knowledge of the physical processes is indispensable, unless one prefers to work from the metaphysical side, which is immensely distasteful to me. I therefore kept to physics, clinging to the subject with such ardor that, though it may well seem ridiculous to say so, I cared little about what part of the world we were in. I preferred to remain aboard where I could work uninterruptedly, and where many an hour gave me such a feeling of being inspired in a way I can never remember having experienced, either before or since. A few flashes of thought that thrilled through me, this was in the harbor of Surabaya, were immediately diligently pursued, leading again in their turn to new subjects. 
Those times are past, but subsequent quiet examination of what then emerged has taught me that it was a truth which cannot only be subjectively felt, but also proved objectively. Whether this could have been done by one who has so little knowledge of physics as I have is a matter which, obviously, I must leave undecided. Heim, in his book on energetics, expresses the opinion that Robert Mayer's new thought did not gradually detach itself by dint of revolving it in his mind from the conceptions of power transmitted from the past, but belongs to those ideas that are intuitively conceived, which, originating in other spheres of a mental kind, surprise thought, as it were, compelling it to transform its inherited notions conformably with those ideas. The question now arises, whence did this new idea that forced itself upon consciousness with such elemental power spring? And whence did it derive such strength that it was able to affect consciousness so forcibly that it could be completely withdrawn from all manifold impressions of a first voyage in the tropics? These questions are not easy to answer. If we apply our theory to this case, the explanation would run as follows. The idea of energy and of its conservation must be a primordial image that lay dormant in the absolute unconscious. This conclusion obviously compels us to prove that a similar primordial image did really exist in the history of the human mind and continued to be effective through thousands of years. As a matter of fact, evidence of this can be produced without difficulty. Primitive religions in the most dissimilar regions of the earth are founded upon this image. These are the so-called dynamistic religions, whose sole and distinctive thought is the existence of some universal magical power upon which everything depends. The well-known English scholars Taylor and Fraser both wrongly interpreted this idea as animism. Primitive peoples do not mean souls or spirits by their conception of power, but in reality something that the American investigator Lovejoy most aptly terms primitive energetics. In an investigation appertaining to this subject, I showed that this notion comprises the idea of soul, spirit, God, health, physical strength, fertility, magic power, influence, might, prestige, curative remedies, as well as certain states of mind which are characterized by the setting loose of effects. Among certain Polynesians, Melunga, that is, this primitive concept of energy, is spirit, soul, demonical being, magic, prestige. If anything astonishing happens, the people cry out, Melungu! This notion of power is also the first rendering of the concept of God among primitive peoples. The image has undergone many variations in the course of history. In the Old Testament, this magic power is seen in the burning bush and shines in the face of Moses. It is manifest in the Gospels as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as cloven tongues of fire from heaven. In Heraclitus, it appears as universal energy, as eternally living fire. For the Persians, it is the fiery brightness, hyoma, divine mercy. For the Stoics, it is Haimarmene, the power of destiny. In medieval legend, it is seen as the aura, or the halo, of the saint. It blazes forth in great flames from the hut where the saint is lying in ecstasy. The saints reflect the sum of this power, the storehouse of light in their faces. According to the ancient concepts, this power is the soul itself. The idea of its immortality contains that of its conservation. The Buddhistic and primitive conception of the metempsychosis, transmigration of souls, contains the idea of its unlimited capacity for transformation under constant conservation. This thought has obviously, therefore, been imprinted on the human brain for untold ages. That's why it lies ready in the unconscious of everyone. Only certain conditions are needed in order to let it appear again. These conditions were obviously fulfilled in the example of Robert Mayer. The greatest and best thoughts form themselves upon these primordial images, which are the ancient common property of humanity. After this instance of the nascence of new ideas out of the treasury of primordial images, we will resume the further delineation of the process of transference. It was seen that the libido of the patient seizes upon its new object in those apparently preposterous and peculiar fantasies, namely the contents of the absolute unconscious. As I already observed, the unacknowledged projection of primordial images upon the physician constitutes a danger for further treatment, which should not be undervalued. The images contain not only every beautiful and great thought and feeling of humanity, but also every deed of shame and devilry of which human beings have ever been capable. Now, if the patient cannot differentiate the physician's personality from these projections, there is an end to mutual understanding, and human relations become impossible. If, however, the patient avoids this charybdis, he falls into the scylla of introjecting these images, that is, he does not ascribe their qualities to the physician, but to himself. This peril is just as great. 
If he projects, he vacillates between an extravagant and morbid deification and a spiteful contempt of his physician. In the case of introjection, he falls into a ludicrous self-deification or moral self-laceration. The mistake that he makes in both cases consists in attributing the contents of the absolute unconscious to himself personally. Thus, he makes himself into both God and devil. This is a psychological reason why human beings have always needed demons and could not live without gods. There is the exception, of course, of a few specially clever specimens of the Homo Occidentalis of yesterday and the day before. Supermen whose god is dead, wherefore they themselves become gods. There is also the example of Nietzsche, who confessedly required chloral in order to be able to exist. These supermen even become rationalistic petty gods with thick skulls and cold hearts. The concept of God is simply a necessary psychological function of an irrational nature that has altogether no connection with the question of God's existence. This latter question is one of the most fatuous that can be put. It is indeed sufficiently evident that man cannot conceive a God much less realize that he actually exists, so little is he able to imagine a process that is not causally conditioned. Theoretically, of course, no accidentality can exist. That is certain, once and for all. On the other hand, in practical life, we are continually stumbling upon accidental happenings. It is similar with the existence of God. It is once and for all an absurd problem. But the consensus gentium has spoken of gods for eons past, and will be speaking of them in eons to come. Beautiful and perfect as man may think his reason, he may nevertheless assure himself that it is only one of the possible mental functions, coinciding merely with the corresponding side of the phenomena of the universe. All around is the irrational, that which is not congruous with reason. And this irrationalism is likewise a psychological function, namely the absolute unconscious, whilst the function of consciousness is essentially rational. Consciousness must have rational relations, first of all, in order to discover some order in the chaos of disordered individual phenomena in the universe, and secondly, in order to labor at whatever lies within the area of human possibility. We are laudably and usefully endeavoring to exterminate, so far as is practicable, the chaos of what is irrational both in and around us. Apparently, we are making considerable progress with this process. A mental patient once said to me, Last night, doctor, I disinfected the whole heavens with sublimate, and yet did not discover any god. Something of the kind has happened to us. Heraclitus the Ancient, that really very wise man, discovered the most wonderful of all psychological laws, namely, the regulating function of antithesis. He termed this in antiodromia, that is, clashing together, by which he meant that at some time everything meets with its opposite. Here I beg to remind the reader of the case of the American businessman, which shows the anantodromia most distinctly. The rational attitude of civilization necessarily terminates in its antithesis, namely, in the irrational devastation of civilization. Man may not identify himself with reason, for he is not wholly a rational being, and never can or ever will become one. That is a fact of which every pedant of civilization should take note. What is irrational cannot and may not be stamped out. The gods cannot and may not die. Woe betide those men who have disinfected heaven with rationalism. God Almightiness has entered into them because they would not admit God as an absolute function. They are identified with their unconscious and are therefore its sport. For where God is nearest, there the danger is greatest. Is the present war supposed to be a war of economics? That's a neutral American business-like standpoint that does not take the blood, tears, unprecedented deeds of infamy and great distress into account, and which completely ignores the fact that this war is really an epidemic of madness. The several parties project their unconscious upon each other, hence the mad confusion of ideas in every head. This is the anantiodomia that occurs in the individual life of man, as well as in that of peoples. The legend of the Tower of Babel turns out to be a tenable truth. Only he escapes from the cruel law of anantodomia, who knows how to separate himself from the unconscious, not by repressing it, for then it seizes him from behind, but by presenting it visibly to himself as something that is totally different from him. This gives the solution of the Scylla and Charybdis problem which I described above. The patient must learn to differentiate in his thoughts between what is the ego and what is the non-ego. The latter is the collective psyche, or absolute unconscious. 
By this means, he will acquire the material with which, henceforward, for a long time, he will have to come to terms. Thereby, the energy that before was invested in unsuitable pathological forms will have found its appropriate sphere. In order to differentiate the psychological ego from the psychological non-ego, man must necessarily stand upon firm feet in his ego function, that is, he must fulfill his duty towards life completely, so that he may, in every respect, be a vitally living member of human society. Anything that he neglects in this respect descends into the unconscious and reinforces its position so that he is in danger of being swallowed up by it if his ego function is not established. Severe penalties are attached to that. As indicated by old Synesius, the spiritualized soul, pneumatike psyche, becomes both god and demon, a state in which it suffers the divine penalties, that is, it suffers being torn asunder by the zagreus, an experience which Nietzsche also underwent at the beginning of his insanity, where, in Ecce Homo, the god whom he was despairingly resisting in front assailed him from behind. In Antiodromia is the being torn asunder into the pairs of opposites, which opposites are only proper to the god, and therefore also to the deified man, who owes likeness to God, to his having prevailed over his gods. End of chapter 14, section 5 Read by Olivia. Chapter 14 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fernando Borrego. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867-1923 through 1923. Chapter 14 6. The Synthetic or Constructive Method We now reach the fifth stage of progressive understanding. The coming to terms with the unconscious is a technical performance to which the name of transcendental function has been given because a new function is produced which being based upon both real and imaginary, or rational and irrational data, makes a bridge between the rational and irrational functions of the psyche. The basis of the transcendental function is a new method of treating psychological materials such as dreams and fantasies. The theories previously discussed were based upon an exclusively causal reductive procedure, which reduces the dream or fantasy of its component reminiscences and the extinctive processes that underlie them. I have already stated the justification, as well as the limitations of this proceeding. It reaches the end of its usefulness at the moment when the dream symbols no longer permit of a reduction to personal reminiscences or aspirations. That is, when the images of the absolute unconscious begin to be produced. It would be quite inappropriate to reduce these collective ideas to what is personal, and not only inappropriate, but even actually pernicious, a fact that has been impressed upon me by disagreeable experiences. The values of the images or symbols of the absolute unconscious are only disclosed if they are subjected to a synthetic, not analytical treatment. Just as analysis, the causally reductive procedure disintegrates the symbol into its components so the synthetic procedure synthesizes the symbol into a universal and comprehensible expression. The synthetic procedure is by no means easy. I will therefore give an example by means of which I can explain the whole process. A patient had the following dream. She was just at the critical juncture between the analysis of the personal unconscious and the commencement of the production of the absolute unconscious. I am on the point of crossing a broad and rapid stream, There is no bridge, but I find a ford where I can cross. As I am just on the point of doing so, a big crab that lay hidden in the water seizes my foot and does not let go. She awoke in fear. Associations with the dream were as follows. 1. Stream. It forms a boundary that is difficult to cross. I must surmount an obstacle. I suppose it refers to the fact that I am getting on very slowly. I suppose I ought to reach the other side. 2. Ford. An opportunity for getting safely across. A possible way. Otherwise, 
the stream would be too difficult. The possibility of surmounting the obstacle lies in the analytical treatment. 3. Crab The crab lay quite hidden in the water. I did not see it at first. Cancer is a fearful, incurable illness. A series of recollections of Mrs. X, who died of cancer, followed. I am afraid of this illness. A crab is an animal that walks backwards. Obviously, it wants to pull me down into the stream. It clutched me in a gruesome way, and I was awfully afraid. What prevents my getting across? Oh yes, I had another great scene with my friend. It must be explained that there is something special about this friendship. We have here an ardent attachment, bordering on the homosexual. It has been going on for years. The friend is in many respects like the patient and is also nervous. They have pronounced artistic interests in common, but the patient is the stronger personality of the two. They are both nervous, and their mutual relation, being too engrossing, cuts them off too much from other possibilities of life. In spite of an ideal friendship, they have at times tremendous scenes, owing to their mutual irritability. Evidently, the unconscious wishes to put some distance between them, but they refuse to pay attention to it. A scene usually begins by one of them finding that she does not yet understand the other well enough and that they ought to talk more openly together, whereupon both make enthusiastic endeavors to talk things out. Misunderstandings supervene almost directly, provoking fresh scenes, each worse than the last. The quarrel was in its way a faute de mia, a pleasure to both of them, which they were unwilling to relinquish. My patient, especially was unable for a very long time to renounce the sweet pain of not being understood by her best friend. Although, as she said, every scene tired her to death, she has long since realized that this friendship has become superfluous and that it was only from mistaken ambition that she clung to the belief that she could yet make something ideal out of it. The patient had formerly had an extravagant, fantastic relation with her mother and after her mother's death, had transferred her feelings to her friend. 7. Analytical Causal Reductive Interpretation This interpretation may be summed up in a sentence. I understand that I ought to get to the other side of the stream, that is, give up the relation with the friend. But I would much rather that my friend did not let me out of her claws. Embrace. That is, expressed as an infantile wish. Mother would like to attract me to herself again by the well-known mode of enthusiastic embraces. The incompatibility of the wish lies in the strong undercurrent of homosexuality, the existence of which has been abundantly proved by obvious facts. The crab seizes her foot, the patient having big, manly feet. She plays a masculine part towards her friend, having also corresponding sexual fantasies. The foot is known to have phallic significance. Detailed evidence of this is to be found in Agramont's writings. The complete interpretation would run as follows. The reason why she will not let her friend go is because her unconscious homosexual wishes are set upon her. As these wishes are morally and aesthetically incompatible with the tendency of the conscious personality, they are repressed and therefore unconscious. The fear is an expression of this repressed wish. This interpretation is exceedingly depreciative of the patient's high-pitched conscious ideal of friendship. It is true, at this point of analysis, she would no longer have taken this interpretation amiss. Sometime before certain facts has sufficiently convinced her of her homosexual tendency, so that she was able to acknowledge the existence of this inclination frankly, although it was of course painful for her to do so. Therefore, if at this stage of treatment I had informed her that this was the interpretation, I should not have encountered resistances from her. She had already overcome the painfulness of this unwelcome tendency by understanding it. But she would have said to me, Why do we analyze this dream at all? It is only repeating what I have now known for a long while. It is true, this interpretation does not reveal anything new to the patient, and it is therefore uninteresting and ineffective. This kind of interpretation would at the beginning of the treatment have been impossible in this case because the patient's prudishness 
would under no circumstances have acknowledged it. The venom of understanding had to be installed very carefully and in the smallest of doses until the patient gradually became more enlightened. But when the analytical or causal reductive interpretation, instead of furnishing something new, persistently brings the same material in different variations, then the moment has come when another mode of interpretation is called for. The causal reductive procedure has certain drawbacks. First, it does not take strictly into account the patient's associations. For example, in this case, the association of the illness, cancer, with crab. Krebs equals cancer. Second, the particular choice of symbol remains obscure. For instance, why does the friend mother appear as a crab? A prettier and more plastic representation would have been a nymph. Half dragged, she him, half sank he down, etc. An octopus, a dragon, a serpent, or a fish could have performed the same services. Third, the causal reductive procedure completely ignores that a dream is a subjective phenomenon and that consequently, even an exhaustive interpretation can never connect the crab with the mother or the friend, but only with the dreamer's idea of them. The whole dream is the dreamer. She is the stream, the crossing, and the crab. That is to say, these details are expressions of psychological conditions and tendencies in the subject's unconscious. I have therefore introduced the following terminology. I call interpretations in which the dream symbols are treated as representations of the real objects, interpretation upon the objective plane. The opposite interpretation is that which connects every fragment of the dream, for example, all the persons who do anything, with the dreamer himself. This is interpretation upon the subjective plane. Objective interpretation is analytical because it dissects the dream contents into complexes of reminiscence and finds their relation to real conditions. Subjective interpretation is synthetic because it detaches the fundamental underlying complexes of reminiscence from their actual causes, regarding them as tendencies or parts of the subject and reintegrating them with the subject. In experiencing something, I do not merely experience the object, but in the first place, myself, although this is only the case if I render myself account of the experience. The synthetic or constructive procedure of interpretation is therefore based upon the version of the subjective plane. 8. The synthetic constructive interpretation. The patient is unconscious of the fact that it is in herself that the obstacle lies which should be overcome, the boundary which is difficult to cross which impedes further progress. But it is possible to cross the boundary. It is true that just here a peculiar and unexpected peril threatens, namely, something animal, non-human, or superhuman, which moves backwards and goes into the depths of the stream, wanting to draw down the dreamer as the whole personality. This danger is, moreover, like the deadly disease of cancer, which begins secretly somewhere, and is incurable, overpowering. The patient imagines that her friend hinders her, pulling her down. So long as this is her belief, she must, perforce, influence her friend, draw her up, teach, improve, educate her, and make futile and impractically idealistic efforts in order to avoid being dragged down herself. Of course, the friend makes similar endeavors, being in a like case with the patient. So both of them keep jumping upon each other like fighting cocks, each trying to fly over the other's head. The higher the point to which one screws herself, the higher must the other also try to get. Why? Because each thinks the fault lies in the other, in the object. Interpretation of the dream on the subjective plane brings deliverance from this absurdity, for it shows the patient that she has something in herself that is hindering her from crossing the boundary, that is, from getting out of the one position or attitude into another. To interpret change of place as change of attitude is supported by the mode of expression in certain primitive languages, where, for example, the phrase, I am on the point of going, is, I am at the place of going. In order to understand the language of dreams, we need plenty of parallels from the psychology of primitive peoples, as well as from historical symbolism.
This is so because dreams originate in the unconscious, which contains the residual potentialities of function of all preceding epochs of the history of the evolution of man. Obviously, in our interpretation, everything now depends upon understanding what is meant by the crab. We know that it symbolizes something that comes to light in the friend. She connects the crab with the friend. And also, something that came to light in the mother. Whether both mother and friend really have this quality in them is irrelevant as regards to the patient. The situation will only be changed when the patient herself has changed. Nothing can be changed in the mother because she is dead. The friend cannot be urged to alter. If she wants to alter herself, that is her own affair. The fact that the quality in question is associated with the mother indicates that it is something infantile. What is there in common in the patient's relation both to her mother and her friend? What is common to both is a violently extravagant demand for love, the patient feeling herself overwhelmed by its passion. This claim is an overpowering infantile craving which is characteristically blind. What is in question here is a part of her libido that has not been educated, differentiated, or humanized, retaining still the compulsive character of an instinct because it has not yet been tamed by domestication. An animal is a perfectly appropriate symbol for this role of libido. But why is the animal a crab in this particular instance? The patient associates cancer with it, of which disease Mrs. X died at the age the patient has just reached. It may, therefore, well be that this is an allusion to an identification with Mrs. X. We must therefore make inquiries about this Mrs. X. The patient relates the following facts about her. Mrs. X was widowed early. She was very cheerful and enjoyed life. She had a number of adventures with men, especially with one particular man, a gifted artist who the patient herself knew personally and who always impressed her as very fascinating and weird. An identification can only result from an unrecognized unconscious resemblance. Now that is the resemblance between our patient and Mrs. X. I was able here to remind the patient of a series of former fantasies and dreams which had shown plainly that she also had a frivolous vein in her, although anxiously repressing it, because she vaguely feared it might seduce her to an immoral life. We have now gained a further essential contribution to a right understanding of the animal role, which evidently represents an untamed instinctive greed, which in this case is directed to men. At the same time, we understand a further reason why she cannot let go of her friend. She must cling to her in order not to fall prey to this other tendency, which seems so much more dangerous. By these means, she remains at an infantile homosexual stage, which serves her as a defense. Experience proves this erection of defenses to be one of the most effective motives of the retention of unadapted infantile relations. But in this missing libido in the animal role lies her well-being, the germ of her future healthy personality, which does not shrink from the hazards of human life. But the patient had drawn another conclusion from the fate of Mrs. X. Having conceived her severe illness and early death as a punishment of fate for her gay life, which the patient, although certainly not confessing to this feeling, always envied her. When Mrs. X died, the patient pulled a long face, beneath which a human, all too human, malicious satisfaction was hidden. As a punishment for this tendency, the patient, taking Mrs. X's example as a warning, deterred herself from living and from further development, and burdened herself with the misery of this unsatisfying friendship. Of course, this concoctination had not been consciously clear to her. Otherwise, she would never have acted as she had done. The truth of this conclusion can be proved by the material. The history of this identification by no means ends here. The patient subsequently emphasized the fact that Mrs. X had a not inconsiderable artistic capacity which developed only after her husband's death and which led to her friendship with the artist. This fact seems to be one of the essential incentives for the identification. If we call to mind that the patient had already told us what a striking impression she had received from the artist. A fascination of this kind is never exclusively exercised by one person only upon the other. 
It is a phenomenon of reciprocal relation between two persons, insofar as the fascinated person must provide a suitable predisposition, but she must be unconscious of this predisposition. Otherwise, there will be no fascination. Fascination is a phenomenon of compulsion which lacks conscious ground. That is, it is not a process of the will, but a phenomenon coming from the surface of the unconscious and forcing itself compulsorily upon consciousness. All compulsions arise from unconscious motives. It must therefore be assumed that the patient possesses a similar unconscious predisposition to that of the artist. She becomes identified with this artist and is also identified with him as man. Here we are at once reminded of the analysis of the dream, where we met an illusion of the masculine foot. As a matter of fact, the patient plays a thoroughly masculine part towards her friend, being the active one who continually takes the lead, commanding her friend and occasionally even forcing her somewhat violently to some course that only the patient desires. Her friend is distinctly feminine both in her external appearance and otherwise, whilst the patient is also externally of a somewhat masculine type. Her voice is stronger and deeper than that of her friend. She now describes Mrs. X as a very feminine woman, her gentleness and amiability being comparable to that of her friend, so she thinks. This gives us a new clue. The patient is obviously playing towards her friend, the artist's part toward Mrs. X. Thus, she unconsciously completes her identification with Mrs. X and her lover. In this way, she is giving expression to her frivolous vein, which she had repressed so carefully. She is not living it consciously, however, but is herself played upon by her own unconscious tendency. We now know a great deal about the crab. It represents the inner psychology of this untamed part of the libido. The unconscious identifications always keep drawing her on. They have this power because being unconscious, they cannot be subjected to insight and correction. The crab is the symbol of the unconscious contents. These contents are always seducing the patient to retain her relation to the friend. The crab goes backwards. But the relation to the friend is synonymous with illness. She became nervous through it hence the association of illness. Strictly speaking, this really belongs to the analysis on the objective plane, but we must not forget that we only arrive at the understanding by applying the subjective interpretation, which thereby proves itself to be an important heuristic principle. For practical purposes, we might rest quite satisfied with the result we have already reached, but we seek here to satisfy all the requirements of the theory, not all the associations have yet been used. Neither is the significance of the choice of symbols yet demonstrated sufficiently. We will now recur to the patient's remark that the crab lay hidden under the water in the stream and that she had not seen it at first. She had not at first perceived the unconscious relations that have just been elucidated. They lay hidden in the water. But the stream is the obstacle preventing her from going across. It is precisely the unconscious relations binding her to her friend that have been hindering her. The unconscious was the obstacle. In this case, therefore, the water signifies the unconscious, or, it were better to say, the being unconscious, the being hidden, for the crab is also something unconscious, namely, the portion of the libido that was hidden in the unconscious. End of chapter 14「Chapter 14 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A.J. Binney Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Constance Ellen Long 1867-1923 Part 9 The dominance of the superpersonal unconscious. The task now lies before us of raising the unconscious data and their relations that have been hitherto understood upon the objective plane to the subjective plane. To this end, we must once more separate them from their objects, conceiving them as images related in a subjective way to function complexes in the patient's own unconscious. Raised to the subjective plane, 
Mrs. X is the person who showed the patient the way to do something that the patient herself feared while unconsciously desiring it. Mrs. X, therefore, represents that which the patient would like to become, and yet does not quite want to. In a certain sense, Mrs. X is a picture of the patient's future character. The fascinating artist cannot be raised to the subjective plane because the unconscious artistic gift lying dormant in the patient has already been covered over by Mrs. X. It would be quite right to say that the artist is the image of the masculine element in the patient, which not being consciously realised, is still lying in the unconscious. In a certain sense this is indeed true, the patient actually deluding herself as regards this matter. That is, she seems to herself to be particularly tender, sensitive and feminine, with nothing in the least masculine about her. She was indignantly amazed when I drew her attention to her masculine traits. But the reason why she is fascinated by something mysterious in the artist cannot be attributed to what is masculine in her. That seems to be completely unknown to her. And yet it must be hiding somewhere, for she has produced this feeling out of herself. Whenever a part of libido similar to this cannot be found, experience teaches us that it has always been projected. But into whom? Is it still attached to the artist? He has long ago disappeared from her horizon and can hardly have taken the projection with him because it was firmly fixed in the patient's unconscious. A similar projection is always actually present. That is, there must somewhere be someone upon whom this amount of libido is actually projected. Otherwise she would have felt it consciously. Thus we once more reach the objective plane, for we cannot discover this missing projection in any other way. The patient does not know any man except myself who means anything at all to her, and as her doctor I mean a good deal to her. Therefore, she has probably projected this part upon me. It is true I had never noticed anything of the kind, but the exquisitely deceptive roles are never presented to the analyst on the surface, coming to light always only outside the hour of treatment. I therefore carefully inquire, Tell me, what do I seem like to you when you are not with me? Am I just the same then? Reply, When I am with you, you are very pleasant and kind. But when I am alone, or have not seen you for rather a long time, then the picture I have in my mind of you changes in an extraordinary way. Sometimes you seem quite idealised, and then again different. She hesitates. I help by saying, yes, what am I like then? Reply. Sometimes quite dangerous, sinister, like an evil magician or demon. I do not know how I get hold of such ideas. You are not really a bit like that. So this part was attached to me as part of a transference. That is why it was lacking in her inventory. Therewith, we recognise a further important thing. I was confused with, identified with, the artist, and in her unconscious fantasy, she is Mrs. X. I was easily able to prove this fact by means of material that had previously been brought to light, sexual fantasies. But I myself then am the obstacle, the crab, that is hindering her from getting across. The state of affairs would be critical if at this particular point we were to limit ourselves to the objective plane of interpretation. What would be the use of my explaining? But I am not this artist at all. I am not in the least weird as he is, nor am I like an evil magician. That would leave the patient quite unconvinced, because she would know as well as I do that the projection would continue to exist all the same, and that it is really I who am hindering her further progress. It is at this point that many a treatment has come to a standstill for there is no other way for the patient here of escaping from the embrace of the unconscious, but for the physician to raise himself to the subjective plane, where he is to be regarded as an image. But an image of what? This is where the greatest difficulty lies. The doctor will say, an image of something in the patient's unconscious. But the patient may object. What, am I to suppose myself to be a man, a mysteriously fascinating one to boot, a wicked wizard and a demon? No. I cannot accept that. It is nonsense. I'd sooner believe that you are all that. She is really, so to speak, quite right. It is too preposterous to want to transfer such things to herself. She cannot permit herself to be made into a demon, any more than can the physician. Her eyes flash. A wicked expression appears upon her face. A glimmer of an unknown hate never seen before. Something snake-like seeming to creep into her. I am suddenly faced by the possibility of a fatal misunderstanding with her. What is it? Is it disappointed love? 
Is she offended? Does she feel depreciated? There seems to lurk something of the beast of prey, something really demonic in her glance. Is she then after all a demon? Or am I myself the beast of prey, the demon, and this is a terrified victim sitting before me, who is trying to defend herself with a brute force of despair against my wicked spells? But either idea must be nonsense, fantastical delusion. What have I come in contact with? What new string is vibrating? But it is only for a passing moment. The expression upon the patient's face becoming quiet again, she says, as if relieved, It is extraordinary. I feel as if you had touched the point which I could never get over in relation to my friend. It is a horrible feeling, something non-human, wicked, and cruel. I cannot describe how queer this feeling is. At such moments, it makes me hate and despise my friend, although I struggle against it with all my might and main. An explanatory light is thrown upon what has happened by this observation. I have now taken the friend's place. The friendship has been overcome. The ice of repression is broken. The patient has, without knowing it, entered upon a new phase of her existence. I know that now, upon me will fall everything painful and bad in the relation to the friend. So also will whatever was good in it, although in violent conflict with the mysterious unknown quantity X, about which the patient could never get clear. A new phase, therefore, of the transference supervenes, which, however, does not as yet make clearly apparent what the X that is projected upon me consists of. It is quite certain that the most troublesome misunderstandings threaten if the patient should stick at this stage of the transference. In that case, she will necessarily treat me as she treated her friend. That is, the X will continually be somewhere in the air giving rise to misunderstandings. The end would probably be that she would see the evil demon in me, because she is quite unable to accept the fact that she is herself the demon. All insoluble conflicts are brought about in this way and an insoluble conflict signifies a standstill in life. Another possibility is that the patient should disregard the obscure point by applying her old preventative against this new difficulty. That is, she would repress it again, instead of keeping it conscious, which is the necessary and obvious demand of the whole method. Nothing is gained by such repression. On the contrary, the X threatens more from the unconscious where it is considerably more unpleasant. Whenever such an unacceptable image emerges, one must decide whether at bottom it is destined to represent a human quality or not. Magician and demon may represent qualities that are described in this particular fashion, in order that they may speedily be recognized as not human but mythological qualities. Magician and demon, being mythological figures, aptly express the unknown, non-human feelings which had surprised the patient. These attributes are not applicable to a human personality, being, as a rule, judgments of character intuitively and not critically approved, which are projected upon our fellow beings, inevitably doing serious injury to human relations. Such attributes always indicate that contents of the superpersonal or absolute unconscious are being projected. Neither demons nor wicked magicians are reminiscences of personal experiences, although everyone has, of course, at some time or other heard or read of them. Although one has heard of a rattlesnake, it would hardly be appropriate to describe a lizard or a blind worm as a rattlesnake, simply because one was startled by their rustling. Similarly, one would hardly term a fellow being a demon, unless some kind of demonical influence were closely associated with him. If, however, the demonical influence were really part of his personal character, it would show itself everywhere, and then this human being would be a demon, a kind of werewolf. But such an ascription is mythology. In other words, it is from the collective and not from the individual psyche. Inasmuch as through our unconscious we have a share in the historical collective psyche, we naturally dwell unconsciously in a world of werewolves, demons, magicians, etc. These being things which have always affected men most profoundly. We have just as much a part in gods and devils, saviors and criminals. But it would be absurd to want to ascribe to one's personal self the possibilities that are potentially existing in the human unconscious. It is therefore essential to make as clear a distinction as possible between the personal and the impersonal assets of our psyche. This is by no means intended to nullify the occasional great effects due to the existence of the contents of the absolute unconscious. But these contents of the collective psyche should be differentiated from those belonging to the individual psyche. For simple-minded people, of course, these things were never separated. 
the projection of gods, demons, etc., not having been understood as a psychological function, was simply accounted concretistical realities. The projectional character was never perceived. It was only with the advent of the epoch of scepticism that it was realised that the gods did not really exist except as projections. With that, the matter was set at rest. But the psychological function corresponding to it was by no means set at rest. For it lapsed into the unconscious and began to poison men with a surplus of libido that had hitherto been invested in the cult of idols or gods. Obviously, the depreciation and repression of such a powerful function as that of religion has serious consequences for the psychology of the individual. The reflux of this libido strengthens the unconscious prodigiously, so that it begins to exercise a powerful compulsory influence upon consciousness and its archaic collective contents. One period of scepticism came to a close with the horrors of the French Revolution. At the present time, we are again experiencing an ebullition of the unconscious destructive powers of the collective psyche. The result is an unparalleled general slaughter. That is just what the unconscious was tending towards. This tendency had previously been inordinately strengthened by the rationalism of modern life, which by depreciating everything irrational, caused the function of irrationalism to sink into the unconscious. But the function once in the unconscious will from thence work unceasing havoc, like an incurable disease whose centre cannot be eradicated. For then the individual and the nation alike are compelled to live irrationally, and even to apply their highest idealism and their best wit to make this madness of irrationalism as complete as possible. We see examples of this on a small scale in our patient. She turned from a possibility of life that seemed to her irrational, Mrs. X, in order to live it in a pathological form, to her own loss, and with an unsuitable object. There is indeed no possible alternative but to acknowledge irrationalism as a psychological function that is necessary and always existent. Its results are not to be taken as concrete realities, that would involve repression, but as psychological realities. They are realities because they are effective things, that is, they are actualities. The collective unconscious is the sediment of all the experience of all the universe of all time, and is also an image of the universe that has been in process of formation for untold ages. In the course of time, certain features have become prominent in this image, the so-called dominants. These dominants are the ruling powers, the gods, that is, the representations resulting from dominating laws and principles, from average regularities in the issue of the images that the brain has received as a consequence of secular processes. Insofar as the images formed in the brain are relatively faithful portrayals of psychic happenings, they will correspond to their dominance. That is, their general characteristic features, made prominent by the accumulation of similar experiences, will correspond to certain physical fundamental facts that are also universal. Hence, it is possible to transfer unconscious images to physical events direct as intuitive ideas. E.g., ether, the primeval breath or soul substance appears in man's conceptions the whole world over. So too, energy, the magic force, which is equally widespread. On account of their connection with physical things, the dominants usually make their appearance as projections, appearing, indeed, if the projections are unconscious, in the persons of the immediate environment, as a rule, in the form of abnormal under- or overvaluations, which excite misunderstandings, conflict, infatuations, and various kinds of folly. People say, he makes a god of so-and-so, or so-and-so is X's bête noir. They also give rise to the formation of modern myths, that is, fantastic rumours, suspicions, and prejudices. The dominance of the collective unconscious are therefore extremely important things of significant effect to which great attention should be paid. They must not be repressed, but must be given most careful consideration. They usually appear as projections, and since projections only attach where there is some external stimulus, it is very difficult to appraise them aright, on account of the relation of the unconscious images with the object. If someone projects the dominant of devil into a fellow being, this occurs because this other person has something in him that makes the attachment of the devil dominant possible. But that is by no means to say that this person is therefore, so to speak, a devil. On the contrary, he may be a particularly good fellow, but being antipathetic to the one who projects, a devilish effect is brought about between the two. This does not mean that the one who projects is a devil, 
although he must recognise that he too, just as much, has something devilish in him, and has been gulled by it, inasmuch as he projected it. But that does not make him a devil. Indeed, he may be just as decent a man as the other. In such a case, the appearance of the devil dominant means the two persons are incompatible, for the moment and for the near future. Wherefore, the unconscious splits them asunder and holds them apart from each other. One of the dominants that is almost always met in the analysis of projections of collective unconscious contents is the magical demon. It is of preponderating sinister effect. The golem, by Meyerink, is a good example of this. Also the Tibetan wizard in Meyerink's Flendermalsen, who lets the world war loose by magic. Obviously Meyerink formed this image independently and freely out of his unconscious by giving word and picture to a feeling similar to the one that my patient had projected upon me. The dominant of magic also appears in Zarathustra, while in Faust, it is, so to say, the hero himself. The picture of this demon is the lowest and most elementary concept of God. It is the dominant of the primitive tribal magic man, or a singly gifted personality endowed with magic power. This figure very frequently makes an appearance in my patient's unconscious as a dark-skinned being of Mongolian type. An important step forward has been taken by the recognition of the dominance of the absolute unconscious. The magical or demonic effect of the fellow being is made to disappear by the feeling being realised as a definite projection of the absolute unconscious. On the other hand, a completely new and unsuspected task now lies before us. Namely, the question in what way the ego should come to terms with this psychological non-ego. Should one rest satisfied with having verified the effective existence of unconscious dominance, leaving the matter to take care of itself? To leave it at this point would be the means of creating a permanent state of dissociation in the subject, a conflict between the individual psyche and the collective psyche. Upon the one side, we should have the differentiated modern ego, whilst upon the other, a kind of uncivilized negro, representative of a thoroughly primitive state. That would mean that we should have what really does exist, a crust of civilization over a dark-skinned brute. The cleavage would be distinct and demonstrable before our very eyes. But such a disassociation requires immediate synthesis and cultivation of what is undeveloped. There must be a union of these two aspects. Before entering upon this new question, let us first return to the dream from which we started. The discussion has given us a broader understanding of the dream, and especially of an essential part of it, namely, the fear. This fear is a demonic fear of the dominance of the collective unconscious. We saw that the patient identifies herself with Mrs. X, expressing thereby that she also has some relation to the mysterious artist. It was apparent also that she identified the physician, myself, with the artist. And further, that when taken upon the subjective plane, the image of the wizard dominance of the collective unconscious represented me. All this is covered in the dream by the symbol of the crab which walks backwards. The crab stands for the living content of the unconscious that can by no means be exhausted or rendered inoperative by analysis on the objective plane. But what we were able to do was to detach the mythological or collective psychological contents from the objects of consciousness and to consolidate them as psychological realities outside the individual psyche. So long as the absolute unconscious and the individual psyche are coupled together without differentiation, no progress can be made, or, as the dream expresses it, no boundary be crossed. If the dreamer does nevertheless prepare to cross the boundary, the unconscious that was hitherto unnoticed becomes animated, seizing her and dragging her down. The dream and its material characterize the absolute unconscious, on the one side as a lower animal living hidden in the depths of the water, and on the other side as a dangerous disease that can only be cured by a timely operation. To what extent this characterization is appropriate has already been seen. As was pointed out, the animal symbol specially refers to what is extra-human, that is, super-personal for the contents of the absolute unconscious are not merely the residue of archaic human functions, but also the residue of functions of the animal ancestry of mankind, whose duration of life was indeed vastly greater than the relatively brief epoch of specifically human existence. If such residues are active, they are apt, as nothing else is, not merely to arrest the progress of development, 
but also to divert the libido into regressive channels until the quantity which the absolute unconsciousness activated has been absorbed. The energy becomes profitable again after it has been consciously contrasted with the absolute unconscious, a process which enables it to be converted into a valuable source from which to draw. This transference of energy was established by religions in a concretistic manner through cultural communication with the gods, the dominance of the absolute unconscious. But these modes and customs are too much at variance with our intellect and our moral sense for us to be able to declare this solution of the problem as still binding, or even possible. If, on the other hand, we apprehend the images of the unconscious as collective unconscious dominance, therefore as collective psychological phenomena or functions, this hypothesis is in no way opposed to our intellect and conscience. This solution is rationally acceptable. We have thus gained the possibility of coming to terms with the activated residues of our ancestral history. This mode of settlement makes it possible to traverse the boundary line hitherto limiting us, and is therefore appropriately termed the transcendental function, which is synonymous with progressive development to a new attitude. In the dream, this development is indicated by the other side of the stream. The similarity to hero myths is striking. The typical combat of the hero with the monster, the unconscious content, frequently takes place on the banks of some water, sometimes at a ford. This circumstance is prominent in legends of Red Indians, as, for example, in Longfellow's Hiawatha. In the decisive battle, the hero is swallowed by a monster, cf. Story of Jonah as Robinius has shown by means of extensive material. But inside the monster, the hero begins to come to terms with the beast in his own way. Whilst the creature swims with him towards the sunrise, he cuts off a valuable piece of the viscera, e.g. the heart, by which the monster lived, that is, the valuable energy by which the unconscious was activated. Through this deed he kills the monster, who then drifts to land, where the hero, born anew through the transcendental function, the night journey under the sea of Frobenius, steps forth, often in company with all those beings whom the monster had previously swallowed. This enables the normal state to be restored, as the unconscious, having been robbed of its energy, no longer occupies a preponderating position. In this way, the myth, which is the dream of a people, graphically describes the problem with which our patient is concerned. The problem of how to come to terms with the absolute unconscious is a question apart. I must content myself here with a general survey of the new theory of the unconscious up to the transcendental function, leaving the presentation of the transcendental function itself to a later work. End of The Dominance of the Superpersonal Unconscious Recording by A.J. Binney Chapter 14 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina from Vancouver. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867 to 1923. Chapter 14, Part 10. The development of the types of introversion and extroversion in the analytical process. The description of the analysis of the unconscious would be incomplete if a word were not said about the question whether this method is equally applicable to the two types. As a matter of fact, both the development and the conception of the unconscious are different for each type. Although making every effort to find out a formulation that shall be as universally valid as possible, we must emphatically impress upon our minds the fact that the two modes of conception of the types are essentially different. A universal formulation that is just only becomes possible when both standpoints are given equal consideration. I do not conceal from myself the fact that this subject is of less interest to the layman than to the specialist. Nevertheless, certain aspects of the question are of such great character that the layman should not find the perusal of this last section entirely without interest. Let us first consider the conception of the unconscious. 
I have here introduced the unconscious under the conception of a psychological function, namely, the function of the sum of all those psychic contents which do not reach the threshold of consciousness. I have divided the unconscious materials into personal, that is, to reminiscence attributable to personal experiences, combinations, and tendencies, and into interpersonal collective content, that is, those whose content cannot be attributed to personal experiences. The contents of the psyche are fundamentally images indicating function on one hand and upon the other objects and the world generally. The conscious contains the recent object images, the personal unconscious, the object images of the individual past, so far as they have either been forgotten or repressed. Whilst the absolute or collective unconscious contains the inherited world images generally, under the form of primordial images or mythical themes. All psychic images have two sides. The one, being directed toward the object, is as faithful a likeness of the object as possible, framed without any intention or obligation to be anything else. The other side is directed towards the soul, that is, towards the psychic function and the laws particular to it. Let us take as an example a primordial image of a hero myth. There is in the West a demon ancestress with a large mouth. The hero creeps into it, and at the same moment a certain little bird sings. The ancient dame shuts her mouth with a bang, and the hero disappears. The side of the image directed toward the physical object means the sun goes down in the evening into the mouth of the ocean. At this hour a certain little bird sings which is an objective fact, and the sun disappears into the depths of the sea. The side of the image directed towards the soul, that is the idea, signifies the energy contained in consciousness disappears, like the sun in the evening, into the monster of the unconscious. If we consider the collective unconscious from the side of the soul or idea, It is something entirely distinct, and it must be differentiated, abstracted from the object, if its contents are to attain the perfection of an idea. If, on the other hand, we consider the collective unconscious from the side of the physical object, that is, as an image of an object, it is weaker and less clear than the object itself, and can only be brought to perfection if it is objectified, that is, projected on to the object itself. As previously explained, there are two types of human psychology that can be clearly distinguished, viz. introversion and extroversion. The introvert is characterized by the thought standpoint, the extrovert by the feeling standpoint. As I showed, they are quite different in their relation to the object. The introvert, abstracting from the object and thinking about it, whilst the extrovert goes to the object and feels himself into it. The accent of value lies upon the ego for the introvert, but upon the object for the extrovert. The former chief concern is the preservation of the ego, that of the latter the preservation of the object. The two types will adopt a different attitude towards the unconscious, namely the introvert will and must seize the idea side of the unconscious image. The extrovert, on the other hand, seizing the side of the physical reflection. The introvert will purify as far as possible the idea side from the alloy of the concretistic admixture of the physical image in order to arrive at the abstract idea. Whilst, on the other hand, the extrovert will purify the physical image as far as possible from the fantastic admixture of the enveloping ideas. The former, by raising himself to a world of idea, will endeavor to overcome the disturbing influence of the unconscious, whilst the latter will approach the object as near as possible and project the unconscious image into the physical object, thus freeing himself from the grip of the unconscious. What for the extrovert is a fantastic and disturbing admixture in the unconscious picture is for the introvert precisely that which has the most value. For it is the germ of the pure idea, 
and vice versa, what for the introvert are merely concretistical imperfections, survivals of a physical origin are for the extrovert a most valuable hint, a bridge by which unconscious can be united with the object. This description makes it manifest that the two types go contrary ways in the course of the development of their unconscious, arriving therefore at opposite extremes, the one at the idea, the other at the object of his feeling. The psychological characteristics of the types are eventually pushed to extremes, where according to the enantiodromic laws, the moment has arrived when in each case the other function enters into its fully acknowledged right. That is, feeling in the case of the introvert and thought in that of the extrovert. The introvert attains the lacking function of autonomous feeling by means of a differentiation and enhancement of his thought, whilst the extrovert, on the other hand, attains his thinking by the way of an increasingly differentiated love. These functions that hitherto were secondary are found at first in the unconscious gradually reaching consciousness in the course of development. At first, they are unconscious functions in a state that is more or less incompatible with consciousness and have the typical qualities of unconscious content. These qualities are such as are not tolerated in the consciousness. The lunatic Schreber says most amply that the language of God, the unconscious, is a somewhat archaic but vigorous German of which he gives a few striking examples, as the contrary function that emerges from the unconscious into consciousness differs to such an extent from what appears to be acceptable to consciousness. The necessity arises of a technique for coming to terms with the contrary function. It is impossible to accept the contrary function as it stands, as it always drags extraneous qualities and accompanying circumstances with it from the absolute unconscious. Though the above described development, the extrovert has acquired an adaptation to the object that is absolutely real and free from all fantasies. He will therefore be able to turn his attention toward the alloy, which for the introvert was the valuable germ of ideas. From this, he will then develop similar ideas to those which the introvert has already developed. Vice versa, the introvert will now be able to turn his attention to those materials which before he was obliged to reject, as being sidetracks on the road to physical reality. That is, he will carry out the same clearing and would knowing in his feeling relations that the extrovert has already completed. The development of the contrary function that was hitherto unconscious leads to individuation beyond the type, and thereby to a new relation to the world and mind. The process which begins with the complementation of the types is the transcendental function, which leads to a new adaptation by means of the clearing and knowing of unconscious feelings and thoughts that have been brought up by the contrary function that have been neglected. Following the old maxim, Naturum si secumur ducem nunquam aberam bimis, we have obeyed the natural impulse of the thinker to carry the principle of thought through to its utmost perfection attainable, as also that of the feeler of carrying the principle of feeling through to the end. By these means, the salutary extreme was produced, to wit, the hunger, the desire for the compensatory function. For, by means of thought, the one is landed in a lifeless, ice-cold world of crystalline ideas, whereas, by means of feeling, the other reaches a limitless ocean of never-ending flood of sentiment. The former will, therefore, yearn for living warmth of feeling, and the latter for the restrictive precision and solidity of thought. An enrichment of the individual is attained by this compensatory process, giving him greater decision and the possibility of a harmony that is complete in itself. The assimilation of the contrary function discloses new inner springs, which guarantee to the individual considerably greater independence from external conditions. This acquisition is an indisputable advantage that none would like to surrender in the face of the fact so unavoidably connected with it.
that a new adaptation and orientation of this kind places the individual in a certain contrast to the great bulk of people who yet have the old attitude. This contrast is no drawback. It is rather a welcome and effective spur to life and work, for thereby is created the channel required by our psychic energy for its development. 11. General Remarks on the Therapy I have still to draw the reader's attention to an important fact. Throughout the course of this paper, I have seemed to associate the idea of disturbance or even apparel with the unconscious. But it would give a false impression if we were only to emphasize the dangerous side of the unconscious. The unconscious is a source of danger when the individual is not at one with it. If we succeed in establishing the function or attitude that I call transcendental, the disharmony ceases and we are permitted to enjoy the favorable side of the unconscious. In such case, the unconscious vouchsafes us from furtherance and assistance which bountiful nature is always ready to give to man in overflowing abundance. The unconscious possesses possibilities of wisdom that are completely closed to consciousness. For the unconscious has at its disposal not only all the psychic contents that are under the threshold because they have been forgotten or overlooked, but also the wisdom of the experience of untold ages, deposited in the course of time and lying potential in the human brain. The unconscious is continually active, creating combinations of its materials. These serve to indicate the future path of the individual. It creates prospective combinations just as our consciousness does. Only they are considerably superior to the conscious combinations both in refinement and extent. The unconscious may therefore be an unparalleled guide for human beings. The reader must on no account suppose that the complicated psychological changes described must all be passed through in every individual case. In practice, the treatment is adjusted according to the therapeutic result attained. The particular result arrived at may be reached at any stage of the treatment, quite apart from the seriousness or duration of the malady. The treatment of a serious case may last a long time without the higher phases of the evolution ever being reached or needing to be reached. There are comparatively few people who, after attaining the desired therapeutical result, pursue the further stages of evolution for the sake of their own development. It is, therefore, not the seriousness of the case which obliges one to pass through the whole development. In any case, only those people attain a higher degree of differentiation who are by nature destined and called to it, that is, who have both a capacity and tendency toward the higher differentiation. This is a matter in which people are extremely different, just as among species of animals there are some that are stationary and conservative, and others that are evolutionary. Nature is aristocratic, but not in the sense of having reserved the possibility of differentiation exclusively for those species that stand high. Similarly, the possibility of the psychological development of human beings is not reserved for specially gifted individuals. In other words, neither special intelligence nor any other talent is necessary in order to achieve a far-reaching psychological development. Inasmuch as in this development moral qualities step in to supplement where intellect does not suffice. But it must not be supposed under any circumstances that the treatment consists in grafting general formulas and complicated doctrines on to people. This is not so. Each one can acquire that which he needs after his own fashion and in his own language. What I have here presented is only the intellectual formulation of the subject founded upon preliminary scientific study of an empirical as well as a theoretical nature. But this formulation does not become a subject of discussion in the ordinary practical analytical work. The brief notes of cases that I have inserted give an approximate idea of the practical side of analysis. 
The reader should realize that our new understanding of psychology has a side that is entirely practical and another that is entirely theoretical. It is not merely a practical method of treatment or education, but it is also a scientific theory that is closely related to other coordinated sciences. Conclusion In conclusion, I must beg the reader to pardon me for having ventured to say so many new and obtruse things in such a brief compass. I lay myself open to adverse criticism because I conceive it to be the duty of everyone who isolates himself by taking his own path, to tell others what he has found or discovered, whether it be a refreshing spring for the thirsty or a sandy desert of sterile air. The one helps, the other warns. Not the opinion of any individual contemporary will decide the truth and error of what has been discovered but rather future generations and destiny. There are things that are not yet true today. Perhaps we are not yet permitted to recognize them as true, although they may be true tomorrow. Therefore, every pioneer must take his own path, alone but hopeful, with the open eyes of one who is conscious of its solitude and of the perils of its dim precipice. Our age is seeking a new spring of life, I found one and drank of it, and the water tasted good. That is all that I can or want to say. My intention and my duty to society is fulfilled when I have described, as well as I can, the way that led me to the spring. The reproaches of those who do not follow this way have never troubled me, nor ever will. New ideas always encounter resistance from the old. That always was and always will be the case. It appertains to the self-regulation of mental progress. End of chapter 14. Recording by Tina, Vancouver, BC. Chapter 15 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867-1923. to Chapter 15. The Conception of the Unconscious. 1. The distinction between the personal and the impersonal unconscious. Since the breach with the Viennese school upon the question of the fundamental explanatory principle of analysis, that is, the question if it be sexuality or energy, our concepts have undergone considerable development. After the prejudice concerning the explanatory basis had been removed by the acceptance of a purely abstract view of it, the nature of which was not anticipated, interest was directed to the concept of the unconscious. According to Freud's theory, the contents of the unconscious are limited to infantile wish tendencies, which are repressed on account of the incompatibility of their character. Repression is a process which begins in early childhood under the moral influence of environment. It continues throughout life. These repressions are done away by means of analysis, and the repressed wishes are made conscious. That should theoretically empty the unconscious, and, so to say, do away with it. But in reality, the production of infantile sexual wish fantasies continues into old age. According to this theory, the unconscious contains only those parts of the personality which might just as well be conscious, and have really only been repressed by the processes of civilization. According to Freud, the essential content of the unconscious would therefore be personal. But although, from such a viewpoint, the infantile tendencies of the unconscious are the more prominent, it would be a mistake to estimate or define the unconscious from this alone, 
for it has another side. Not only must the repressed materials be included in the periphery of the unconscious, but also all the psychic material that does not reach the threshold of consciousness. It is impossible to explain all these materials by the principle of repression. For in that case, by the removal of the repression, a phenomenal memory would be acquired, one that never forgets anything. As a matter of fact, repression exists, but it is a special phenomenon. If a so-called bad memory were only the consequence of repression, then those persons who have an excellent memory should have no repression, that is, be incapable of being neurotic. But experience teaches us that this is not the case. There are undoubtedly cases with abnormally bad memories where it is clear that the main cause must be attributed to repression. But such cases are comparatively rare. We therefore emphatically say that the unconscious contains all that part of the psyche that is found under the threshold including subliminal sense perceptions, in addition to the repressed material. We also know, not only on account of accumulated experience, but also for theoretical reasons, that the unconscious must contain all the material that has not yet reached the level of consciousness. These are the germs of future conscious contents. We have also every reason to suppose that the unconscious is far from being quiescent, in the sense that it is inactive, but that it is probably constantly busied with the formation and reformation of so-called unconscious fantasies. Only in pathological cases should this activity be thought of as comparatively autonomous, for normally it is coordinated with consciousness. It may be assumed that all these contents are of a personal nature insofar as they are acquisitions of the individual life. As this life is limited, the number of acquisitions of the unconscious must also be limited. Wherefore, an exhaustion of the contents of the unconscious through analysis might be held to be possible. In other words, by the analysis of the unconscious, the inventory of unconscious contents might be completed possibly in the sense that the unconscious cannot produce anything besides what is already known and accepted in the conscious. Also, as has already been said, we should have to accept the fact that the unconscious activity had thereby been paralyzed, and that by the removal of the repression, we could stop the conscious contents from descending into the unconscious. Experience teaches us that is only possible to a very limited extent. We urge our patients to retain their hold upon repressed contents that have been brought to consciousness and to insert them in their scheme of life. But, as we may daily convince ourselves, this procedure seems to make no impression upon the unconscious inasmuch as it goes on producing apparently the same fantasies, namely the so-called infantile sexual ones, which according to the earlier theory were based upon personal repressions. If in such cases analysis be systematically continued, an inventory of incompatible wish fantasies is gradually revealed, whose combinations amaze us. In addition to all the sexual perversions, every conceivable kind of crime is discovered, as well as every conceivable heroic action and great thought, whose existence in the analyzed person no one would have suspected. In order to give an example of this, I would like to refer to Mater's schizophrenic patient who called the world his picture book. He was a locksmith's apprentice who fell ill very early in life. He had never been blessed with intellectual gifts. As regards his idea that the world was his picture book and that he was turning its pages over when he looked about in the world, it is just Schopenhauer's world, conceived as will and representation expressed in primitive picture language. This idea has just as universal a character as Schopenhauer's. The difference consists in the fact that the patient's notion has stood still at an embryonic stage in a process of growth, whereas with Schopenhauer the same idea has been changed from a mere image into an abstraction expressed in terms that are universally valid.
It would be false to assume that the patient's idea had a personal character and value. That would be to attribute to him the dignity of a philosopher. But he alone is a philosopher who raises an image that has naturally sprung up into an abstract idea, thereby translating it into terms of universal validity. Schopenhauer's philosophical conception is his personal value, whereas the notion of the patient has merely an impersonal value of natural growth, in which personal proprietary rights can only be acquired by making an abstraction of the images and translating them into terms that are universally valid. But it would be wrong if an exaggerated sense of the value of this achievement led us to ascribe to the philosopher the merit of having made or conceived the original image itself. The primordial image has also sprung up naturally in the philosopher and is nothing but a part of the universal human heritage in which, theoretically at least, everyone has a share. The golden apples come from the same tree whether they are gathered by a locksmith's apprentice or Schopenhauer. The recognition of such primordial images obliges me to differentiate between the contents of the unconscious, a differentiation of another kind, than that between the preconscious and unconscious, or between the subconscious and unconscious. The justification for those distinctions cannot be discussed here. They have a value of their own and probably merit to be carried further as affording a point of view. The differentiation which I propose follows obviously from what has previously been said, namely, that in the so-called unconscious we must differentiate a layer which may be termed the personal unconscious. The materials contained in this layer are of a personal kind, inasmuch as on the one hand they may be characterized as acquisitions of the individual existence, and on the other as psychological factors which might just as well be conscious. It is, for instance, comprehensible that incompatible psychological elements succumb to repression on the one hand and are therefore unconscious, but on the other hand, there exists the possibility of bringing the repressed contents into consciousness and keeping them there, once they are known and recognized. We recognize these materials as personal contents, because we can prove their effects, their partial appearance or their origin to lie in our personal past. They are integral constituents of the personality, and belong to a complete inventory of the same. They are constituents whose omission in consciousness implies an inferiority in one respect or another, not indeed as an inferiority bearing the psychological character of an organic deformity or a natural defect, but rather the character of a neglect which arouses a moral reaction. The feeling of moral inferiority always indicates that in the portion omitted is something that, according to the feelings, should not be missing or in other words, could be conscious if we took sufficient trouble about it. The sense of moral inferiority is not the result of a collision with the universal, in a certain sense arbitrary moral law, but rather the result of a conflict with the personal ego, which by reason of the psychic economy demands an adjustment of the deficiency. Wherever a feeling of inferiority appears... It reveals not only the presence of a demand for the assimilation of an unconscious constituent, but also the possibility of such an assimilation. It is, after all, a person's moral qualities that make him assimilate his unconscious self and retain it in consciousness, whether he be forced to it by a recognition of its necessity or by a painful neurosis. He who continues to tread this path of the realization of his unconscious self necessarily transposes the content of the personal unconscious into consciousness, whereby the periphery of the personality is considerably enlarged. 2. The Consequences of the Assimilation of the Unconscious this process of assimilating the unconscious leads to remarkable results. Some people build up from it an unmistakable, even unpleasantly increased self-consciousness or self-confidence. They know everything, 
and are completely aware of everything so far as their unconscious is concerned. They think themselves accurately informed about everything that comes up from the unconscious. Others are increasingly oppressed by the contents of the unconscious. They lose their self-reliance or their self-consciousness more and more and come near to a state of depressed resignation in regard to all the extraordinary things the unconscious produces. The former undertake in the exuberance of their self-confidence a responsibility for their unconscious that goes much too far, beyond every reasonable possibility. The latter ultimately decline to accept any responsibility in the depressing recognition of the powerlessness of the ego confronted by relentless destiny working through the unconscious. If we give the two types close analytical consideration, we shall discover that behind the optimistic self-confidence of the former, there is hidden a just as deep or rather a far deeper helplessness a helplessness to which the conscious optimism acts as an unsuccessful effort at compensation. Behind the pessimistic resignation of the latter, there is hidden a defiant desire for power, far exceeding in self-confidence the conscious optimism of the former type. This condition of the personality may well be expressed by the idea of God Almightiness, Gatanlichkeit, to which Adler has particularly drawn our attention. When the devil wrote the serpent's words in the student's album, Iritus sicut Deus scientus bonum e malum, he added, Follow the ancient text and the snake thou wast ordered to trample. With all thy likeness to God, thou'lt yet be a sorry example. The idea of likeness to God, or God Almightiness, is not a scientific one, although it characterizes the psychological state of affairs most exactly. Still, we must examine whence this attitude comes and ask why it merits the name of God Almightiness. As the expression denotes, the patient's abnormal condition is constituted by the fact that he ascribes to himself qualities or values which obviously do not belong to him. For God Almightiness means being like the spirit which is set above the human spirit. If, for psychological purposes, we abstract from the hypostasis of the God idea, we find that this expression does not only include every dynamic fact discussed in my book on the psychology of the unconscious, but also a certain mental function having a collective character, which is of another order from that of the individual character of the mind. In the same way, as the individual is not only an isolated and separate, but also a social being, so also the human mind is not only something isolated and absolutely individual, but also a collective function. And just as certain social functions or impulses are, so to speak, opposed to the egocentric interests of the individual, so also the human mind has certain functions or tendencies which, on account of their collective nature, are to some extent opposed to the personal mental functions. This is due to the fact that every human being is born with a highly differentiated brain which gives him the possibility of attaining a rich mental function that he has neither acquired ontogenetically nor developed. In proportion as human brains are similarly differentiated, the corresponding mental functions are collective and universal. This circumstance explains the fact that the unconscious of far separated peoples and races possesses a remarkable number of points of agreement. One example among many others which has been demonstrated is the extraordinary unanimity shown by the autochthonous forms and themes of myths. The universal similarity of brains results in a universal possibility of a similar mental function. This function is the collective psyche which is divided into collective mind and collective soul. 
insofar as there exist differentiations corresponding to race, descent, or even family, so beyond the level of the universal collective psyche, we find a collective psyche limited by race, descent, and family. To quote P. Genet, the collective psyche contains the partie inferieure of the mental function. That is, the part of the mental function which, being fixed and automatic in its action, inherited and present everywhere, is therefore superpersonal or impersonal. The conscious and the personal unconscious contain as personal differentiations the partie supérieure of the mental function. Therefore, the part that has been acquired and developed ontogenetically. An individual, therefore, who joins the a priori and unconsciously given collective psyche onto his ontogenetically acquired assets enlarges thereby the periphery of his personality in an unjustifiable way, with the corresponding consequences, inasmuch as the collective psyche is the partie inferieure of the mental function and therefore is the fundamental structure underlying every personality, it weighs heavily upon and depreciates the personality, a fact that is expressed in the aforementioned stifling of self-confidence and in the unconscious increase of the ego emphasis up to the point of a morbid will to power. Inasmuch as the collective psyche ranks even above the personality, because it is the mother foundation upon which all personal differentiations are based, and because it is the common mental function of the sum total of the individual, therefore its incorporation in the personality may evoke inflation of self-confidence, an inflation which is then compensated by an extraordinary sense of inferiority in the unconscious. A dissolution of the pairs of opposites in the personality sets in if... Through the assimilation of the unconscious, the collective psyche be included in the inventory of the personal mental functions. Alongside the pairs of opposites already alluded to that are so particularly evident in the neurotic, viz. megalomania and sense of inferiority, there are also many other pairs, of which I will only mention the specifically moral pair, that is, good and evil, scientus bonum e malum. They accompany the increase or depreciation of self-confidence. The specific virtues and vices of humanity are contained in the collective psyche just as everything else is. One man ascribes all the collective virtue to himself as his own personal merit. Another accounts as personal guilt what is but collective vice. Both are just as illusionary as the sense of greatness and of inferiority. For imaginary virtues as well as imaginary vices are only the pairs of moral opposites contained in the collective psyche, which have become perceptible or, or have artificially been made conscious. How far the collective psyche contains these pairs of opposites is shown by primitive peoples, whose great virtue is praised by one observer, whereas another observer of the same race reports only the worst impressions. Both views are true of primitive man, whose personal differentiation is only beginning. His mental function is essentially collective. He is more or less identified with the collective psyche, and therefore without any personal responsibility or inner conflict. His virtues and vices are collective. Conflict only begins when a conscious personal development of the mind has already started whereby the reason becomes aware of the irreconcilable nature of the pairs of opposites. The struggle to repress is the consequence of this realization. Man wants to be good, therefore the bad must be repressed. This puts an end to the paradise of the collective psyche. The repression of the collective psyche, insofar as it was conscious, was a necessity for the development of the personality because collective psychology and personal psychology are in a certain sense irreconcilable. In the history of thought, whenever a fresh psychological attitude acquires collective value, the formation of schisms begins. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than in the history of religion. A collective point of view, although it may be necessary, is always dangerous for the individual. It is dangerous because it is apt to choke 
and smother personal differentiation. It has derived this capacity from the collective psyche, which is itself a result of psychological differentiation of the strong gregarious instincts of humanity. Collective thought and feeling and collective accomplishment are relatively easy in comparison with individual function and performance, a fact that is only too prone to lead to a fining down to the collective level and is particularly disastrous to personal development. The concomitant loss of personality is replaced, as is always the case in psychology, by an unconscious, all-compelling binding to and identification with the collective psyche. It cannot be denied and should be warningly emphasized that in the analysis of the unconscious, the collective psychology is merged into the personal psychology with the aforementioned unpleasant consequences. These consequences are either bad for the individual's vital feeling, Lebensgefühl, or they injure his fellow beings if he have any power over his environment. Being identified with the collective psyche, he will inevitably try to force the claims of his unconscious upon others, for identification with the collective psyche is accompanied by a feeling of universal validity, God Almightiness which disregards the different psychology of his fellows. The worst abuses of this kind may be removed by a clear understanding and appreciation of the fact that there are totally different psychological types, and that a psychology of one type cannot be forced into the mold of another. It is indeed almost impossible for one type to understand the other completely, and a perfect comprehension of another's individuality is impossible. Due regard for another's individuality is not only advisable, but is absolutely essential in analysis if the development of the other's personality is not to be stifled. It should not be forgotten that the one type thinks that he is leaving another person free when he grants him freedom of action, and the other type when he grants him freedom of thought. In analysis, both must be conceded, insofar as reasons of self-preservation permit the analyst to accord them. An excessive desire to understand or explain things is just as useless and injurious as a lack of comprehension. The collective natural propensities and primary forms of idea and feeling which analysis of the unconscious has shown to be effective are an acquisition for the conscious personality which cannot be admitted unreservedly without prejudicial results. In practical treatment, it is therefore of the utmost importance to keep the aim of individual development constantly before us. If, for instance, the collective psyche be conceived as a personal possession or as a personal burden, an unbearable weight or strain is put upon the personality. Hence, we must make a clear distinction between the personal and the collective psyche. In practice, this distinction is not easy because the personal grows out of the collective psyche and is most closely joined with it. It is therefore difficult to say which materials are to be termed collective and which personal. There is no doubt, for instance, that the archaic symbols so often found in fantasies and dreams are collective factors. All primary propensities and forms of thought and feeling are collective. So is everything about which men are universally agreed, or which is universally understood, said, or done. Upon close consideration, it is astonishing to note how much of our so-called individual psychology is really collective, so much that the individual element quite disappears. Individuation, however, is an indispensable psychological requirement. The crushing predominance of what is collective should make us realize what peculiar care and attention must be given to the delicate plant individuality, if it is to develop. Human beings have a capacity which is of the utmost use for purposes of collectivism and most prejudicial to individuation, and that is the capacity to imitate Collective psychology cannot dispense with imitation, without which the organization of the state and society would be impossible. Imitation includes the idea of suggestibility, suggestive effect, and mental infection. But we see daily how the mechanism of imitation is used, or rather abused, for the purposes of personal differentiation. 
Some prominent personality or peculiar trait or activity is simply imitated, which at least brings about an external differentiation from the environment. As a rule, this delusive attempt to attain individual differentiation by means of imitation comes to a standstill as mere affectation. The individual remaining on the same plane as before, only a few degrees more sterile than formerly, and under an unconscious compulsory bondage to his environment. In order to find out what is really individual in us, we should have to give the matter deep thought, and we should certainly become aware how exceedingly difficult such a discovery is. End of chapter 15. Sections 1 and 2. Chapter 15 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson. Arizona. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long. 1867 to 1923. Chapter 15. 3. The Individual as an Excerpt of the Collective Psyche. We now come to a problem the overlooking of which would cause the greatest confusion. As I said before, the immediate result of the analysis of the unconscious is that additional personal portions of the unconscious are incorporated into the conscious. I called these parts of the unconscious which are repressed but capable of being made conscious the personal unconscious. I showed, moreover, that through the annexation of the deeper layers of the unconscious, which I call the impersonal unconscious, an extension of the personality is brought about which leads to the state of God Almightiness, Gottanlichkeit. This state is reached by a continuation of the analytical work, by means of which we have already reintroduced what is repressed to consciousness. By continuing analysis further, we incorporate some distinctly impersonal universal basic qualities of humanity with the personal consciousness, which brings about the aforesaid enlargement. And this, to some extent, may be described as an unpleasant consequence of analysis. From this standpoint, the conscious personality seems to be a more or less arbitrary excerpt of the collective psyche. It appears to consist of a number of universal basic human qualities of which it is a priori unconscious, and further of a series of impulses and forms which might just as well have been conscious, but were more or less arbitrarily repressed, in order to attain that excerpt of the collective psyche which we call personality. The term persona is really an excellent one. For persona was originally the mask which an actor wore, that served to indicate the character in which he appeared. For if we really venture to undertake to decide what psychic material must be accounted personal and what impersonal, we shall soon reach a state of great perplexity. For, in truth, we must make the same assertion regarding the contents of the personality as we have already made with respect to the impersonal unconscious. That is to say that it is collective. Whereas we can only concede individuality to the bounds of the persona, that is to the particular choice of personal elements, and that only to a very limited extent, it is only by virtue of the fact that the persona is a more or less accidental or arbitrary excerpt of the collective psyche that we can lapse into the error of deeming it to be in toto individual. Whereas its name denotes, it is only a mask of the collective psyche, a mask which simulates individuality, making others and oneself believe that one is individual, whilst one is only acting a part through which the collective psyche speaks.
If we analyze the persona, we remove the mask and discover that what appeared to be individual is at bottom collective. We thus trace the little god of the world back to his origin, that is, to a personification of the collective psyche. Finally, to our astonishment, we realize that the persona was only the mask of the collective psyche. Whether we follow Freud and reduce the primary impulse to sexuality or Adler and reduce it to the elementary desire for power or reduce it to the general principle of the collective psyche which contains the principles of both Freud and Adler, we arrive at the same result, namely the dissolution of the personal into the collective. Therefore, in every analysis that is continued sufficiently far, the moment arrives when the aforesaid God Almightiness must be realized. This condition is often ushered in by peculiar symptoms, for instance by dreams of flying through space like a comet, of being either the earth, the sun, or a star, or of being either extraordinarily big or small, of having died, etc., Physical sensations also occur, such as sensations of being too large for one's skin, or too fat, or hypnagogic feelings of endless sinking or rising occur, of enlargement of the body or of dizziness. This state is characterized psychologically by an extraordinary loss of orientation about one's personality, about what one really is, or else the individual has a positive but mistaken idea of that which he has just become. Intolerance, dogmatism, self-conceit, self-depreciation, contempt and belittling of not analyzed fellow beings, and also of their opinions and activities, all very frequently occur. An increased disposition to physical disorders may also occasionally be observed, but this occurs only if pleasure be taken therein, thus prolonging this stage unduly. The wealth of the possibilities of the collective psyche is both confusing and dazzling. The dissolution of the persona results in the release of fantasy, which apparently is nothing else but the functioning of the collective psyche. This release brings materials into consciousness of whose existence we had no suspicion before. A rich mine of mythological thought and feeling is revealed. It is very hard to hold one's own against such an overwhelming impression. That is why this phase must be reckoned one of the real dangers of analysis, a fact that should not be concealed. As may easily be understood, this condition is hardly bearable, and one would like to put an end to it as soon as possible, for the analogy with a mental derangement is too close. The essence of the most frequent form of derangement, dementia precox, or schizophrenia, consists, as is well known, in the fact that the unconscious to a large extent ejects and replaces the conscious. The unconscious is given the value of reality, being substituted for the reality function. The unconscious thoughts become audible as voices, or visible as visions, or perceptible as physical hallucinations, or they become fixed ideas of a kind that supersede reality. In a similar, although not in the same way, by the resolution of the persona of the collective psyche, the unconscious is drawn into the conscious. The difference between this state of mind and that of mental derangement consists in the fact that the unconscious is brought up by the help of the conscious analysis. At least that is the case in the beginning of analysis, when there are still strong cultural resistances against the unconscious to be overcome. Later on, after the removal of the barriers erected by time and custom, the unconscious usually proceeds, so to say, in a preemptory manner, sometimes even discharging itself in torrents into the consciousness. In this phase, the analogy with mental derangement is very close. But it would only be a real mental disorder should the content of the unconscious take the place of the conscious reality. That is, in other words, if the contents of the unconscious were believed absolutely and without reserve. 4. The Endeavors to Free the Individuality from the Collective Psyche 1. The Regressive Restoration of the Persona 
The unbearableness of thus being identified with the collective psyche forces us to find a radical solution. There are two ways open. The first possibility is the regressive one of trying to restore the persona to its former condition by endeavoring to restrain the unconscious by the application of a reductive theory. For instance, by declaring it to be nothing but long repressed and overdue infantile sexuality, for which it would really be best to substitute the normal sexual function. This solution is based upon the unmistakable sexualistic symbolism of the language of the unconscious and upon the concretistic interpretation of the same. Or, an attempt may be made to apply the power theory by conceiving the God Almightiness as a virile protest and as an infantile striving for power and self-preservation, a theory for which support is found in the unmistakable pretensions to power that the unconscious material contains. A further possibility would be to declare the unconscious to be the archaic collective psychology of primitive man, an explanation that would not only cover the sexualistic symbolism and the God Almighty aiming for power of the unconscious content, but would also apparently do justice to the religious, philosophical, and mythological aspects and tendencies of the unconscious content. In every case, the conclusion arrived at is the same, viz., that the unconscious is nothing but this or that, which has already been adequately recognized and acknowledged as infantile, useless, meaningless, impossible, and out of date. There is nothing to be done but to shrug one's shoulders and resign oneself to the inevitable. To the patient there seems to be no alternative, if one wishes to continue to live sensibly, but to restore in so far as is possible that extract of the collective psyche termed persona, to lay the fact of analysis silently aside and do one's utmost to forget that one possesses an unconscious. We shall find support in Faust's words. The sphere of earth is known enough to me, the view beyond is barred immutably. A fool who there his blinking eyes directeth, and o'er his clouds of peers a place expecteth. Firm let him stand and look around him well. This world means something to the capable. Why needs he through eternity to wend? He here acquires what he can apprehend. Thus let him wander down his earthly day. When spirits haunt, go quietly his way. In marching onward bliss and torment find, though every moment with unsated mind. This would be a happy solution if one really could succeed in throwing off the unconscious to such an extent as to withdraw the libido from it, and so render it inoperative. But experience proves that energy cannot be withdrawn from the unconscious. It continues operative, for the unconscious contains and is indeed itself the source of libido, from which issue the primary psychic elements, thought feelings, or feeling thoughts, undifferentiated germs of idea and sentiment. It would therefore be a delusion to believe that by means of some, so to say, magical theory or method, the libido could be conclusively wrested from the unconscious, or that it could be to a certain extent disconnected. One may yield to this illusion for a time, but some day he will be obliged to declare with Faust. Now fills the air so many a haunting shape that no one knows how best he may escape. What though one day with rational brightness beams, the night entangles us in webs of dreams. From our young fields of life we come elate. There croaks a bird, what croaks he? Evil fate. By superstition constantly ensnared, it grows to us and warns and is declared. Intimidated thus we stand alone, the portal jars, yet entrance there is none. Is anyone here? Care. Yes, must be my reply. Faust. And thou, who art thou then? Care. Well, here am I. 
Faust. Avant! Care. I am where I should be, though no ear should choose to hear me. Yet the shrinking heart must fear me, though transformed to mortalized. Grimmest power I exercise. The unconscious cannot be analyzed to a finish and thus brought to a standstill. No one can wrest active force from it for any length of time. Therefore, to act according to the method just described is only to deceive oneself and is nothing but a new addition of an ordinary repression. 2. The Identification with the Collective Psyche The second way would be that of identification with the collective psyche. That would mean the symptom of God Almightiness developed into a system. In other words, one would be the fortunate possessor of the absolute truth that had yet to be discovered, of the conclusive knowledge which would be the people's salvation. This attitude is not necessarily megalomania, Grusenvon, in a direct form, but the well-known milder form of having a prophetic mission. Weak minds which, as is so often the case, have correspondingly an undue share of vanity and misplaced naivete at their disposal, run a considerable risk of succumbing to this temptation. The obtaining access to the collective psyche signifies a renewal of life for the individual, whether this renewal of life be felt as something pleasant or unpleasant. It would seem desirable to retain a hold upon this renewal for one person because it increases his feeling for life, Lebensgefühl, for another because it promises a great accretion to his knowledge. Therefore, both of them, not wishing to deprive themselves of the rich values that lie buried in the collective psyche, will endeavor by every means possible to retain their newly gained union with the primal cause of life. Identification appears to be the nearest way to it, for the merging of the persona in the collective psyche is a veritable lure to unite oneself with this ocean of divinity, and oblivious of the past, to become absorbed in it. This piece of mysticism belongs to every finer individual, just as the yearning for the mother, the looking back to the source whence one originated, is innate in everyone. As I have demonstrated explicitly before, there is a special value and a special necessity hidden in the regressive longing, which, as is well known, Freud conceives as infantile fixation or as incest wish. This necessity and longing is particularly emphasized in myths, where it is always the strongest and best of people, in other words, the hero, who follows the regressive longing and deliberately runs into danger of letting himself be devoured by the monster of the maternal first cause. But he is a hero only because, instead of letting himself be finally devoured by the monster, he conquers it, and that not only once, but several times. It is only through the conquest of the collective psyche that its true value can be attained, whether it be under the symbol of capture of treasure, of an invincible weapon, of a magical means of defense, or whatever else the myth devises as the most desirable possession. Hence, whoever identifies himself with the collective psyche also reaches the treasure which the dragon guards, but against his will unto his own great injury by thus allowing himself, mythologically speaking, to be devoured by the monster and merged with it. Identification with the collective psyche is therefore a failure. This way ends just as disastrously as did the first, which led to the severance of the persona from the collective psyche. End of chapter 15. Sections 3 and 4. Chapter 15 of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. 
Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867 to 1923. Chapter 15. 5. Leading Principles for the Treatment of Collective Identity. In order to solve the problem how practical treatment can overcome the assimilation of the collective psyche, we must first of all make quite clear to ourselves what was the error of the two ways already described. We saw that neither the one way nor the other led to any appropriate result. The first way simply leads the patient back to the point of departure, having lost the vital values contained in the collective psyche. The second way leads him straight into the collective psyche, having lost that detached human existence which alone renders possible a bearable and satisfying life. There are on both sides values that should not be lost to the individual. The mistake is, therefore, neither in the collective psyche nor in the individual psyche, but in allowing the one to exclude the other. The monistic tendency assists this propensity, for it always suspects and looks for one principle everywhere. As a general psychological tendency, monism is a peculiarity of differentiated feeling and thought, corresponding to the keen desire to make the one or the other function the supreme psychological principle. The introversion type only knows the thought principle, and the extroversion type only that of feeling. This psychological monism, or it would be better to say monotheism, has the advantage of simplicity and the disadvantage of one-sidedness. On the one hand, it signifies the exclusion of the variety and true riches of life, whilst on the other, it means the practicability of realizing the ideals of the present day and of the near past. But it does not in itself signify any possibility of human progress. In the same way, rationalism tends towards exclusiveness. Its essence is to exclude instantly whatever is opposed to its standpoint, whether it be intellectually logical or emotionally so. In regard to reason, it is both monistic and autocratic. Special thanks are due to Bergson for having broken a lance for the right of the irrational to exist. Psychology will probably be obliged to acknowledge and to submit to a plurality of principles in spite of the fact that this does not suit the scientific mind. Only so can psychology be saved from shipwreck. But with regard to individual psychology, science must waive its claims. For to speak of a scientific individual psychology is in itself a contradictio in ejecto. It is necessarily always only the collective part of an individual psychology that can be the subject of scientific study. For the individual is, according to definition, something unique and incomparable. A scientific individual psychology is a denial of individual psychology. It may justly be suspected that individual psychology is indeed a projection of the psychology of him who defines it. Every individual psychology must have its own textbook, for the universal textbook only contains collective psychology. These remarks are intended to prepare for what has to be said about the treatment of the aforesaid problem. The fundamental error of both the aforementioned ways is simply that the subject is collectively identified with the one or the other part of his psychology. His psychology is individual as well as collective, but not in such a manner as to merge the individual with what is collective, or the collective with what is individual. The persona must be strictly separated from the concept of the individual, insofar as the persona can be absolutely merged with the collective. But what is individual is just that which can never be absorbed in the collective, and is, too, never identical with the collective. Therefore, an identification with the collective or an arbitrary cutting off from the collective is equivalent to illness. It is pathological. 
As has already been indicated, what is individual appears at first as the particular selection of those elements of the collective psyche that contribute to the composition of the persona. As I said before, the components are not individual but collective. It is only their combination or the selection as a model of particular groups that had already been combined, which is individual. That would be the individual nucleus, which is concealed by the personal mask. By the particular differentiation of the persona, the resistance is shown of the individuality to the collective psyche. By analyzing the persona, we transfer a greater value to the individuality, increasing thereby its conflict with collectivity. This conflict, obviously, is a psychological conflict in the individual. The dissolution of the compromise between the two halves of a pair of opposites increases the effectiveness of the contrast. This conflict does not exist within the sphere of purely unconscious natural life, although the purely physiological life of the individual also has to comply with collective demands. The natural unconscious attitude is harmonious. The body, with its capacities and needs, providing immediately indications and limitations that prevent intemperance and lack of proportion. A differentiated psychological function, however, always inclines towards disproportion on account of the one-sidedness which is cultivated by the conscious rationality of intention. What is called mental individuality is, also, an expression of the individual corporeity being, so to speak, identical with it. This sentence might obviously also be reversed, a fact that does not materially alter the real psychological data concerning the intimate relation of the individuality to the body. At the same time, the body is also that which makes the subject resemble all others to a great extent, although it is the individual body that is differentiated from all others. Similarly, the mental or moral individuality differs from all others, although in every respect it is so constituted as to place one person on an equality with all others. Every living creature that is able freely to develop itself individually without any coercion at all will, through the perfecting of its individuality, soonest realize the ideal type of its species, and therefore, figuratively speaking, will have collective validity. The persona is always identical with a typical attitude in which one psychological function dominates, e.g. feeling or thought or intuition. This one-sidedness always causes the relative repression of the other functions. In consequence of this circumstance, the persona is hindering to the development of the individual. The dissolution of the persona is, therefore, an indispensable condition of individuation. It is, therefore, to some extent impossible to achieve individuation by means of conscious intention. For conscious intention leads to a conscious attitude which excludes everything that does not suit. But the assimilation of the unconscious contents leads, on the contrary, to a condition in which conscious intention is excluded being replaced by a process of development that appears to us irrational. This process alone signifies individuation, its product being individuality as defined above, viz., as something individual that is at the same time universal. So long as the persona exists, individuality is repressed betraying itself at most by the particular selection of personal requisites, of what might be called the actor's costumes. Only when the unconscious is assimilated does the individuality become more prominent, and with it also that uniting psychological phenomena between the ego and the non-ego expressed by the word attitude is now no longer a typical attitude, but an individual one. What is paradoxical in these formulations arises from the same cause from which the conflict about the universalia formerly arose. The phrase animal nolumque animal genus est makes the fundamental paradox clearly comprehensible. 
what exists really is individual. That which is universal is existing psychologically, but being caused by the real existing similarities of individual things. The individual is, therefore, the individual thing that has, to a greater or less extent, those attributes upon which the collective conception of collectivity rests. And the more individual he is, the more he develops those attributes that are the basis of a collective concept of human nature. If a grotesque figure, suggested by the initial situation of our problem, be permitted, it is Buridan's ass between the two bundles of hay. His questioning is obviously wrong. The question is not whether the hay bundle on the right or the left be the better one, or whether he should begin to eat on the right or on the left hand. But what he himself would like to do, what he is eager for, that is the point. He is thinking of the hay and not of himself, and therefore he does not know what he really wants. The question is, what at this moment is the natural direction of the growth of this individual? This question cannot be settled by any philosophy, religion, or good advice, but solely by an unprejudiced review of the psychological germs of life, which have resulted from the natural cooperation of the conscious and the unconscious on the one hand, and of the individual and the collective on the other. One person looks for them in the conscious, and another in the unconscious. But the conscious is only one side, and the unconscious is only the other. For it should never be forgotten that dreams are compensatory or complementary to consciousness. Were this not the case, we should be obliged to regard dreams as a source of knowledge superior to the conscious. This view would undoubtedly carry us back to the mentality of the augur, and we should have to accept all the consequences of such a superstitious attitude, unless, indeed, we look upon dreams as valueless, as does the vulgar mind. We find the unifying function that we are seeking in the fantasies in which everything that has any effectual determination is present. But fantasies have a bad reputation among psychologists. The psychoanalytical theories hitherto obtaining have treated them accordingly. For both Freud and Adler, the fantasy is nothing but a so-called symbolic disguise of what both investigators suppose to be the primary propensities and aims. But in opposition to these views, it should be emphasized, not for theoretical but for essentially practical reasons, that the fantasy may indeed be thus causally explained and depreciated but that it nevertheless is the creative soil for everything that has ever brought development to humanity. The fantasy, as a psychological function, has a peculiar non-reducible value of its own, whose roots are in both the conscious and the unconscious contents, and in what is collective as well as in what is individual. But whence comes the bad reputation of the fantasy? It owes that reputation chiefly to the circumstance that it ought not to be taken literally. It is worthless if understood concretistically. If we understand semiotically as Freud does, it is interesting from the scientific standpoint. But if it be understood hermeneutically as an actual symbol, it provides us with the cue that we need in order to develop our life in harmony with ourselves. For the significance of a symbol is not that it is a disguised indication of something that is generally known, but that it is an endeavor to elucidate by analogy what is as yet completely unknown and only in process of formation. The fantasy represents to us that which is just developing under the form of a more or less apposite analogy. By analytical reduction to something universally known, we destroy the actual value of the symbol. But it is appropriate to its value and meaning to give it an hermeneutical interpretation. The essence of hermeneutics, an art that was formerly much practiced, consists in adding more analogies to that already given by the symbol. In the first place, subjective analogies given by the patient as they occur to him.
and in the second place, objective analogies provided by the analyst out of his general knowledge. The initial symbol is much enlarged and enriched by this procedure, the result being a highly complex and many-sided picture which may now be reduced to tertia comparationis. Thence results certain psychological lines of development of an individual, as well as collective nature. No science upon earth could prove the accuracy of these lines. On the contrary, rationalism could very easily prove that they are wrong. But these lines vindicate their validity by their value for life. The chief thing in practical treatment is that people should get a hold of their own life, not that the principle of their life should be provable or right. Of course, true to the spirit of scientific superstition suggestion will be mooted. But it should long ago have been realized that a suggestion is only accepted by one it suits. Beyond that, there is no suggestion. Otherwise, the treatment of neurosis would be extremely simple, for we should only need to suggest health. This pseudoscientific talk about suggestion is based upon the unconscious superstition that suggestion actually possesses some real magical power. No one succumbs to suggestion unless from the very bottom of his heart he be willing to cooperate. By means of the hermeneutical treatment of the fantasies, we arrive at the synthesis of the individual with the collective psyche. Put theoretically, that is, but practically, one indispensable condition is yet lacking, for it belongs to the regressive disposition of the neurotic, a disposition in which he has been confirmed in the course of his illness to take neither himself nor the world seriously, but always to rely on this or that method or circumstance to effect a cure, quite apart from his own serious cooperation. But you can't wash the dog without getting his skin wet. No cure can be effected without unlimited willingness and absolute seriousness on the part of the patient. There are no magical cures for neurosis. Just as soon as we begin to elaborate the symbolic outlines of the path, the patient must begin to walk thereon. If he delude himself and shirk it, no cure can result. He must really work and live according to what he has seen and recognized as the direction for the time being of his individual lifeline, and must continue thereon until a distinct reaction of his unconscious shows him that he is beginning in good faith to go a wrong way. He who does not possess this moral function of faithfulness to himself will never get rid of his neurosis. But he who has this faithfulness can find the way out. Neither physician nor patient must yield to the delusion that being analyzed is in itself sufficient to remove a neurosis. That would be deception and self-delusion. Ultimately, it is infallibly the moral factor that decides between health and illness. By the construction of the individual's lifeline, the ever-varying trends and tendencies of his libido are made conscious. These lifelines are not identical with the directing fictions discovered by Adler, which are none other than arbitrary attempts to cut the persona off from the collective psyche and to give it independence. It might rather be said that the directing fiction is an unsuccessful attempt to construct a lifeline. The unsuitability of the directing fiction is also proved by the fact that the lines are tenaciously retained for much too long a time. The hermeneutically constructed lifeline is short, for life follows no straight lines that indicate the future long beforehand. For, as Nietzsche says, all truth is crooked. Lifelines are therefore neither principles nor ideals of universal validity, but points of view and adaptations of ephemeral validity. An abatement of vital intensity, a perceptible loss of libido or an excessive passion or ecstasy, all show that one such line is left, and that a new line begins, or rather should begin. Sometimes it is enough to leave the revealing of the new line to the unconscious. 
but this course should indeed not be recommended to the neurotic under all circumstances. Though there are cases where what is needed is to learn to trust to so-called chance. However, it is not advisable to let oneself drift for any length of time. A watchful eye should at least be kept upon the reactions of the unconscious, that is to say, upon the dreams. These indicate, like a barometer, the one-sidedness of our attitude. Therefore, I consider it necessary, in contrast to some other analysts, for the patient after analysis to remain in contact with the unconscious if he would avoid a relapse. That is why I am convinced that the real end of analysis is reached when the patient has acquired adequate knowledge of the method to remain in contact with the unconscious and sufficient psychological knowledge to be able to understand approximately his ever-changing lifeline. Otherwise, he is not in a position to follow the direction of the libido currents in the unconscious and thereby to gain conscious support in the development of his individuality. Every serious case of neurosis needs this weapon in order to maintain the cure. In this sense, analysis is not a method that is a medical monopoly, but rather an art or technique or science of psychological life, which he who has been cured must continue to foster for the sake of his own welfare and that of his environment. If he understands this aright, he will not pose as a psychoanalytical prophet nor as a public reformer, but truly understanding the common weal, he will first himself reap the benefit of the self-knowledge acquired in his treatment, and then he will let the example of his life work what good it can, rather than indulge in aggressive talk and missionary propaganda. Summary A. Psychological material must be divided into conscious and unconscious contents. 1. The conscious contents are partly personal, insofar as their universal validity is not recognized, and partly impersonal, that is, collective, insofar as their universal validity is recognized. 2. The unconscious contents are partly personal, insofar as they concern solely repressed materials of a personal nature that have once been relatively conscious and whose universal validity is therefore not recognized when they are made conscious. Partly impersonal, insofar as the materials concerned are recognized as impersonal and of purely universal validity, of whose earlier even relative consciousness, we have no means of proof. b. The composition of the persona. 1. The conscious personal contents constitute the conscious personality, the conscious ego. 2. The unconscious personal contents constitute the self, the unconscious or subconscious ego. 3. The conscious and unconscious contents of a personal nature constitute the persona. C. The composition of the collective psyche. 1. The conscious and unconscious contents of an impersonal or collective nature compose the psychological non-ego, the image of the object. These materials can appear analytically as projections of feeling or of opinion but they are a priori collectively identical with the object imago. That is, they appear as qualities of the object and are only a posteriori recognized as subjective psychological qualities. 2. The persona is that grouping of conscious and unconscious contents which is opposed as ego to the non-ego. The general comparison of personal contents of different individuals establishes their far-reaching similarity, extending even to identity, by which the individual nature of personal contents and therewith of the persona is, for the most part, suspended. To this extent, the persona must be considered an excerpt of the collective psyche and also a component of the collective psyche. 3. 
The collective psyche is therefore composed of the object imago and the persona. D. What is individual? 1. What is individual appears partly as the principle that decides the selection and limitation of the contents that are accepted as personal. 2. What is individual is the principle by which an increasing differentiation from the collective psyche is made possible and enforced. 3. What is individual manifests itself partly as an impediment to collective accomplishment and as a resistance against collective thinking and feeling. 4. What is individual is the uniqueness of the combination of universal, collective, psychological elements. E. We must divide the conscious and unconscious contents into individualistic and collectivistic. 1. A content is individualistic whose developing tendency is directed towards the differentiation from the collective. 2. A content is collectivistic whose developing tendency aims at universal validity. 3. There are insufficient criteria by which to designate a given content as simply individual or collective, for uniqueness is very difficult to prove, although it is a perpetually and universally recurrent phenomenon. 4. The lifeline of an individual is the resultant of the individualistic and collectivistic tendency of the psychological process at any given moment. End of chapter 15. End of Collected Papers on Analytical Psychology by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Constance Ellen Long, 1867 to 1923.